Uh, hi, everyone. I, <laughs> okay, uh, I see some people here. We're still waiting for a few more people to join. So I think we can wait um, about five minutes for the other people who registered to join, and then we're going to um, soon begin the open house. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. We'll now begin the open house. 
Uh, just to introduce briefly who I am, I'm currently Vice President of KIDA. I am Juwon Park from Korea University. I was President of KUDC last year and I'm currently Vice President of KIDA since last summer. And yeah, I'm 21st Vice President of KIDA until this summer. Uh, next to me, I have Jihee. Yeah, she's President of KIDA currently. She was once president of YUU, Yonsei Underwood Union, and she's currently HDS. So she's um, doing her graduate um, master's, right? Yeah, master's in interpretation in hops. So this is our schedule from two to three, we're gonna have orientation um, and Q&A. And then we're gonna have open house, which is a show debate and show mock adjudication, mock oral adjudication. And then from four to 4.30, we're gonna have Q&A session regarding the debate or keto or whatever thing you guys want to hear from us. And next we're gonna have a lecture from Yun Chan Ku, who is the champion of the most recent nationals. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and we also have an event. So basically it's guessing the show debate winning side. We have two teams, government and opposition. So affirmative and opposition. After the debate, private message, Kita Secretariat. So this is me speaking here. Uh, you, you can see Kita Secretariat account on this participants list or on the chatting list. Please find me on the Zoom and um, type um, government win or opposition win. And we're going to choose five people among the people who sent the message to us, who guessed it correctly. And we're going to send them gift icons after the open house. So yeah, please participate a lot. Okay. Um, basically, welcome to our community. You are here because you are interested in English debating. I know that you guys have passed through the exhausted and um, like application process or interview process of your own debate society. You guys probably had your own open house or show debate or first session in your own society. But we would like to today tell you about who are we, who are Kira as a community, and how can you make best of your time here, even outside of your society, and how you can meet diverse people outside of your own society and in Kira and meeting different people. So who are we? So KIDA is a abbreviated version of Korea InterVarsity Debate Association. We're established in 2006. We're a representative body of Korean university students that engage in English language parliamentary debate specifically. So there are probably different Korean debate group, uh, debate um, clubs or English debate clubs, but we're exclusively and specifically for parliamentary debate. And we have two different formats that I'm gonna introduce you to you later. Uh, we have about like, 15 to 16 years of history so far. And we have um, hosted different tournaments and different um, like activities or MTs or different workshops, just like we're doing right now. Um, basically, there are currently here 14 society members in our um, KIDA, like official member, but there are also some sub members who are also kind of um, joining KIDA or although they might not be joining KIDA like as an official member, still we are trying to participate with them in diverse ways and diverse mechanism and also outside of Korea. So the basically 14 debate societies are Seogang, Chungang, and we have two societies in Iwa, uh, which is Day and Edis. Next we have HDS, which is from Hankook University of Foreign Studies, HYDS from Hanyang, IDS and KDS from Kyunghee, and KMADC, which is a bit special society who joined us two years ago, which is Korea Military Academy um, Debate Club. We have KUDC from Korea University, um, Solbridge SDS from Daejeon. We have Skeda, Songgyungan University, Snuda from Seoul, and YUU from Yonsei University. Uh, next is KIDA Council. So KIDA Council consists of council members from each university's debate society, institution, and the KIDA Secretariat. So as you guys already know, there are people like seniors in your societies. Um, so presidents or you, some societies have council members, right? Like logistics manager or session manager. There are vice presidents and presidents. Those people are a council member of your own society. And every month, your society's heads or the presidents or vice presidents come to council meeting and we discuss and advance some important issues and agendas for the debating community of Korea. And so we host monthly KIDA council meeting. Usually, not usually, always this KIDA council meeting was being held offline in every offline session. It was hosted in different universities. So KIDA secretariat members like we rent 
a university venue and that we host Kira Council meeting and we also had some socials. But due to COVID-19, since last year, almost all of the KCM was being hosted online. Um, KCM is open to anyone and everyone in Kira. So if you'd like to observe our Kira Council meeting and if, if you'd like to add an agenda or express your opinion regarding Kira matters and affairs, please feel free to approach us. We have monthly Kira um, Council meeting and we always post when and where and how the KCM will be conducted on our Kita public forum and also on our Kita page. So if you want to observe or participate, please just approach us by any means. So uh, basically Kita council meeting, we do a lot of things. We discuss about constitution amendment. We discuss about feedback or Q and A session about the tournament so that we can enhance the tournament quality in the next um, experience. We also have votes on different tournaments. Like for instance, which society will gonna host um, this year's spring nationals, which society will gonna host pro-am tournament this year. Those are the things or votes that we have in Kita council meeting. So now I'd like to introduce the Kita Secretariat. We plan training sessions and events. We also host and help hosting tournaments. We provide overall supervision of projects that are conducted by societies. So basically we have Kita Council and Kita Secretariat. So when the Kita Secretariat was made, me and Chihi was elected as a president and vice president. And after being elected, we recruited secretariat members from different societies. And now we have five members from different societies that are who are joining us and they are helping us with Kita affairs. So Kita events, uh, what Kita Secretariat does, we first uh, have open sessions. We also join, do joint sessions with other society. We do joint sessions with Kita, or sometimes we can meet different people outside of the Korean circuit. Membership training and leadership training. This is what we plan to do if COVID gets better, but yeah, hopefully, but if not, we're also planning to have this on online if time allows, maybe next um, presidency can do, but anyway, membership training and leadership training is what Kita do. Um, two years ago, we had offline membership training. So I heard that it was a really nice social stay rented, a really nice place to have some drinks, play games and meet people. So if um, situation gets better and if you have a membership training, I highly recommend you to join uh, membership training because in tournament, it's very restricted and the atmosphere is kind of stiff because anyway, it's based on competition and you meet people in competitive atmosphere, but membership training is a bit more free and you can meet diverse people from different societies. We also host workshops. So today we have Kita Rookie Open House slash um, AP Spring Open House. We also have Rookie Workshop, which is a lecture uh, specifically focused on strategies and lectures that can be useful for debaters on Rookie stage. We also host Judge Workshop to train people to become better judges. So we show a show debate and let them people to have a sample oral adjudication or make a sample ballot about uh, that showed given show debate. We hosted this on summer. This was offline. We are also planning to have some tab workshop because um, debate societies always are kind of lacking tab masters who can run the tournaments and be um, run the tabby cat system for the tournament. So we're also planning to have some tab workshop to teach people to learn tab and how to tap for the tournament. So those are some workshops that we're planning to do and we have done in our secretariat term. So tournaments, uh, I'd like to introduce some tournaments that we have currently in Kita. The first thing is institutional. So institutional tournament means that you must must team up with, the, with your society members and your team name should be KDC1 or Seoul2, uh, HDS3. So that's how the institutional tournament works. So in a national scale, so domestic scale, we have two institutional tournaments. First thing is Kita National Championship. In short, KNC, we have twice a year, spring AP and fall is BP. So I think you guys already received the lectures about what AP and BP is in your respective society. AP is Asian parliamentary, the lecture and debate you will see today and BP is fall season British parliamentary. We have four teams there, but I think we will gonna have separate workshop there. So yeah, more information would be held on that. So basically KNC is held spring and fall if there is no bidding society or time gets a little bit lagged due to like COVID like this last year. So last year we had summer KNC and winter KNC, but I think we're now back on track. So we're going to have spring AP KNC and fall BP KNC. 
Um, Kita Rookie Tournament goes name as well. This is called Kita RT or KRT. This is also being held spring and fall. So Kita Rookie Tournament is always held before KNC so that the rookie debaters can practice debate in the RT and then move on to KNC. In international scale, there are more diverse institutional tournaments. In AP format, there are Austros. Austros, uh, basically, it's AP format, a little bit different, but I think you can look for more information in Austros' Facebook page. But Austros is also basically AP format. United Asian Debating Championship is the biggest Asian parliamentary debate in um, AP format held in Asia for Asian um, university students. In BP format, we have the biggest uh, world's biggest tournament, which is World Universities Debating Championship. I also recommend you to watch some videos of world's finals. There are really cool speakers who debate on the final speech. Northeast Asia Debating Championship, NEADC, which was in former NIAO, but now it's called NEADC. So this is a also a really big BP tournament that Korean university students or KIDA students can participate. Last year in 2020, 2020 Salbridge, SDS and Kita Society hosted NEADC and there were over 70 teams who participated. So it's a really cool experience to go to NEADC. Uh, NEADC or Worlds, Austros, UADC, all of those tournaments is hosted by different university and different country, different city every year. So if um, pandemic gets better after vaccination, I really, really highly recommend you guys to travel, to go to Asia British Parliamentary, ABP Worlds, NEADC, and meet some debaters from different circuits and experience diverse debaters because um, every debater from different country have different debate styles and I think it would be a really great educational experience. So open tournaments. Open tournaments are usually have tournament name like something something and open. So open means you can team up with literally anyone. So you can bring your high school friend or you can team up with your um, senior. You can team up with any different people from different societies, um, a debater from another country. You're, there's totally no restrictions as to who you can team up with. So in national or domestic scale, in AP format, we have CUDS Open being held on winter. Chihi in front of me was chief adjudicator for the most recent CUDS Open. In BP format, we have Kita Open Summer. This is the biggest tournament Kita Secretariat holds, and this is also really, really fun. This last year, Kita Open was, uh, we, we had like more than 200 participants. It was really big, and we had diverse um, chief adjudicators from, from Philippines, from Malaysia. So it's also a, it's a domestic national tournament, but it also has a great international scale and style of motions and debaters. So I, I highly recommend you to join Kita Open as well. Kita Pro Am is a bit special tournament. So this is a BP format, meaning one person should be a pro speaker and one person is amateur speaker. So pro and amateur teams up together and it's a educational purpose tournament that's held every winter um, by Kita. So Pro Am is also really fun. Recently, HDS Hops hosted Kita Pro Am. So if you have, if you're an AM speaker, if you have a senior that you would like to debate together, please ask them. And if you're a senior speaker, please take one of your juniors to um, experience more better debates in Kita Pro Am. So Kita Pro Am is also a tournament that we have. Um, we also have YUU Monthly. So YUU Monthly is a monthly or it happens like one once in every two or three months or one month I guess once in every month um, but anyway it it's being held at least two or three times every year and it usually happens before big tournaments so like for instance before KNC before NEADC it's held on both AP and BP depending on the season and depending on the tournament that happens after YUU monthly it's a one-day mini tournament so it's a really great educational experience. There's no pressure of winning a speaker awards or champions. Of course, they do give you like a champion or like the best speaker, but it's much, much less pressure and it's much casual. So YUU Monthly is a great practice tournament or session that you can go. Also, because of COVID, um, Snuda Ivy or Seoul Open, these tournaments were not being held last year. But I think if COVID gets better, I think these tournaments will also be open um, as well. In international scale, in AP, we have International Christian University Tournament, ICUT. Uh, ICUT is actually being <laughs> held right now, 
So yeah, so from today to tomorrow is actually ICUT. So I think a lot of our friends are debating in ICUT right now. ICUT is also a really great tournament for you to go. It's one of the most really, really fun and exciting AP tournaments you can go. The cherry blossom trees are really pretty there in Tokyo, although I've never been there. So yeah, if again, the situation gets better, I really recommend you to you to go to ICUT. A lot of Kira debaters go there because it's like, a big before the actual semester things or exam really gets being started. So it's really good to go socialize and debate. Taiwan Debate Open TDO is also a very famous international AP tournament. In BP format, you have Kyushu Debate Open QDO. This is also a Japan uh, debate tournament held in Japan. And there's also Japan British Parliamentary. And also if you join different like Facebook groups, you'll probably get diverse information about really diverse tournaments. There are literally numerous tournaments held every weekend, every month. So I recommend you to join different debate groups and to get some information if you want to join different online tournaments. Also, uh, yep. So for tournaments, as I said, join Kita Public Forum on our Facebook to get some information, especially regarding Kita affairs. But if you also want to join some more international tournaments or want to become more engaged in debate activity, I recommend you to join Asia Debating and Debate Series Posting Facebook group for more information on international tournaments. Over especially Debate Series Posting, you'll be able to get um, diverse debate related matters, lectures, or people share some questions on that um, for, um, platform. So I recommend you to join there too. Um, 2021 spring semester Kira calendar. So this is the link and we will gonna upload this PPT and the recording on the Kira YouTube channel and the Kira council meeting and Kira public forum as well. So if you guys are curious about what are some other events Kira will gonna host in this semester, please refer to this calendar and go to this link and check, uh, check out what kind of events we're gonna have this semester. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our Kita Secretariat members. So this is the photos of us. So our pres president is Chi Hee Yoon, as I've introduced, uh, affiliated to YUU and HTS currently. I'm Vice President Juwan, affiliated to KUDC. Secretary is Yeun Pyeon from Snuda. She is in charge of writing down the minutes of Kita Council meeting. Um, Treasury is Pyong Gonjong from KDS. He is in charge of managing all the KIDA budget, account settlement, and managing the money of KIDA. Planning and development is Yun Chan Ku from Snuda and Ji Yong Ru from KODC. They are planning tournament, they plan tournaments, um, they plan different activities of KIDA, they prepare for activities, they do a lot of things regarding how Kita should host activities and those events and so on and so forth. Public re relations and design, Suyeon Moon, she's from HDS. She is in charge of all the designs and valuable um, design assets like PPT, posters, or whatever design we need. She's in charge of all of those really pretty things that she are currently um, working on. So this is our secretariat members. Um, so this is all for our introduction. If you do, you guys have any questions? Um, hi guys, my name is Jihi. I'm the president of Kira, as Chuan mentioned before. I guess a couple of things. Um, I think Chuan has covered all of them. So hopefully this is this gives you more information on what Kira does. Um, a couple of things that I think um, are important are one, I think that especially regarding the coronavirus, we've had a lot of chaotic moments in the past year because people were not really sure about the transition from offline to online tournaments, how um, society should handle sessions when people really haven't met each other face to face, how do we continue on with drinking or social meetings or whatnot. Um, however, I do think that 2021 is a bit of a, it's a new old year in that the coronavirus is still here and we would really much prefer it if it weren't, but we also have become more accustomed to the fact that this is going to be here for a while. And um, the Kita Secretariat as well has been planning a lot of workshops and tournaments 
and other events to um, help you guys as well. So yeah, um, I'm the, I think I'm the oldest member here probably. I've been debating since 2016 when I was a freshman at YUU. And um, now I'm a freshman. I, I don't want to say that word, but I'm also, um, I'm also a new member of HDS as well. So I like, I remember the days where we would go to tournaments and um, like during the vacation time, we would go to trips like to Japan or to Taiwan or during the semester, we would go to China or other nations and we would debate. And that was a really good experience as well. However, I think that um, one, of the, one of the perks of having online tournaments is that it also um, increases accessibility to tournaments that we haven't been able to go to in the past. So tournaments in Europe or, or the US or tournaments in Southeast Asia, where we are able to meet people from diverse backgrounds and diverse and have an um, experience debating with them. So I highly encourage all of you to go beyond the scopes of just Korean debating and go to these tournaments as well. Um, yeah, and I think also this is just my perspective or my experience um, as a debater. I'm not really sure what kind, what motivation you had to join debating. Perhaps some of you have been debating in middle school and high school and want to continue doing that. Perhaps some of you um, just want to le learn a little bit more English and that's fine as well. Um, I think I've also received this question a lot. Um, the half joking answer that I give is I'm not really talented in anything else. So I don't dance, I don't sing, I don't do sports but I liked, I liked speaking in English, I like English. So I thought, well, why not give it a try? And I think um, that was the first step for me, but debating has really become a big part of my identity, whether it be helping me um, develop ideas or develop, develop my opinions or being able to craft rebuttals that are helpful in debate as well, but are also really helpful in classes because professors are always going to be like, are you that kid that asks questions and kind of tries to argue with me? Um, but I think also debating goes much more beyond just debating. It also helps us create relationships with peers, not only within our own societies, but inside Kita as well. So I've made a lot of friends in YUU, but I've also made a lot of friends in different societies as well. And we would go to tournaments together. We would, um, I guess, organize tournaments together, or we would try to um, engage in different debating activities that would keep us interested for a while. So um, I know that perhaps being on like debating shifting online might make might make it a little bit more difficult, but we really still highly encourage um, all fresh all freshmen all rookies um, to join tor tournaments or events or any workshops that either the Kita Secretariat has planned or other organizations have planned so that you're able to meet each other. And perhaps when things get better, I know that I've been seeing this for a long time. Um, hopefully this will happen in reality in the near future. Um, you guys will be able to gather for a drink and talk about the good, the bad old days when we had the coronavirus. Um, so yeah, um, that was a very weird pep talk that I'm not really sure if you guys needed or wanted, but I said it anyway ways. Um, two more means of communication that perhaps might be helpful for you. We do have our official Instagram page. It's at Kira Secretariat. And we follow all of the um, all 14 societies that are officially registered in Kira. So if you want any information um, regarding these societies, we recommend that you go visit Kira Secretariat on Instagram as well. We also have our own YouTube page, as Chuan mentioned before, um, it's called Channel Kira. And we upload um, videos from um, the grand finals of tournaments. We also upload um, lectures or any workshops that we've had in the past. So if you want to go visit more, I guess, um, more older versions of lectures that I've given, that um, other people have given, we also highly recommend that you do so as well. Um, so yeah, um, also regarding tournaments, the easiest way for you to get information is through your society heads, which are going to be your presidents and vice presidents. The reason why um, Kira Council meetings happen every month is so we are able to update the society heads and they're able to tell you the information regarding tournaments. So if you have any, inf any information or any question regarding tournaments, I always encourage you to go to your society head. They'll probably have the questions that you um, want answered. But second, we also recommend that you join the Kita Public Forum Facebook page, as we've, as we've told you before, because that's where most of the information regarding the important domestic tournaments and also international tournaments are going to take place. Um, so yeah, it's very nice to meet all of you. And we have a lot of things planned today. So stick around and um, we, I hope, I, I'm looking forward to meeting you guys in the future as well. 
Um, thank you so much. We're going to have a short break until 2.40. That's when the show debaters are going to be here. And then we're going to start right away for show debate. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, again, oh, and we forgot to mention this. Um, there's no pressure for you to turn on your cameras, but we would like it if a lot of us could turn on our cameras so that it brings us some more, I guess, non-online vibe. So we would like to see your expressions. We would like to see how you thought of what we said. So that would really help us in terms of um, future direction. So yeah, we highly encourage that you do that. For the show debate, we are going to have the debaters turn on their cameras as well. Um, before we begin, because we did tell the debaters that the debate will start from three and they're still having their preparation time right now, we thought that it would be um, nice um, to cover some topics or questions that I'm pretty sure that you might have had or concerns that you've had um, with debating in this semester or the years to come. Um, so the first question that we often receive is, is it okay if I am not fluent in English? I think it's, um, I guess, um, some assumption that people make that when you speak English fluently, it is going to be easier for you to win tournaments. It's going to be easier for you to win rounds. I think the first thing that we all agree is that as mostly as Koreans, but even as um, people from, not from Korea, we are not English as their premier language, right? We are English as second language. We have our own mother tongue and we spent years learning English. So I think to a certain extent, all of us have had some level of difficulty with English in the past. But second, um, parliamentary debate or debate in as a whole is not just about which words you speak or which expressions you say. It's actually about the logic behind your arguments, how you're able to present your arguments, examples, rebuttals, and use them to win that round. So um, I don't think it's true. And this is something that I've experienced both as a debater as, and as a judge, that if you speak English better than your opponent, you are automatically going to win. That's not going to be the case because because the judges are going to listen to the content of what you speak. So, and this is especially important um, either for debaters that say, hey, I speak English good and I can win, or debaters that are perhaps a bit um, under, I guess, they are a bit discouraged from debating because they think that they are not good at English. So um, we are all here to learn and we are all, and speaking English a lot, whether it be seven minutes, whether it be giving your adjudication is really going to help with your English as a whole. So we highly, I encourage you to abandon such talks, such such thoughts and, and debate with us as well. The second question is, I am new to parliamentary debating. And this is something that I think a lot of you may have experienced when debating if you're seniors as well. I constantly lose. I don't understand this argument. What does what like what happens when I'm a rookie, right? So the reason why we have tournaments such as rookie tournaments is because we've all been there before. We all understand that being a rookie is difficult. Like it's new. It's, it's impressive, but sometimes I also want to win. Sometimes I also want to compete with people that perhaps come from a similar background or have the same experience as me. So that's why um, this is just a shameless plug for the rookie tournament that's happening next week. Hopefully uh, most of you are attending that tournament. Uh, we highly encourage you to go there and you're going to learn uh, other arguments on, or other examples. And you're also going to listen to high quality feedback from the judges that are going to be there as well. So uh, I think a rookie, being a rookie, and I've also been a rookie for the first um, semester or two of my collegiate debating as, uh, debating life as well. It's it's a very new and weird time for you in that it's kind of like a mark that you're able to use. So I can be the rookie champion, I can be the rookie finalist, I can be the rookie best speaker, but it also allows you to have a chance to improve and compete with others that perhaps have debated longer for you and you're able to have um, accolades or accomplishments in that particular field as well. So everyone has been new or everyone is new right now. There's no need for you to be worried. We're all here to learn. The third question, and this is probably the more realistic question or concerns that people have regarding debating, right? What happens if debate collides with my exams? What happens if I want to study where I have to study and sometimes I can't? Um, I think this is something that not only debaters, but also judges or organizers or us as the PETA secretariat also have, right? Um, grad school is very difficult and just very annoying in general. And I have a lot of exams and a lot of, I guess, homework as well. So what the KEDA Secretariat does and what the KEDA Council tries to do is we have the big tournaments, whether it be the rookie tournament, whether it be KNC, um, weeks before exam period, so that you're able to focus on those tournaments and then focus on your 
um, I guess, status as a student as well. But we also have things like weekly sessions for those of you that are more invested in debating. And we also have things like open sessions of other um, societies as well. So don't be too worried. We are going to make sure that the important um, important events do not collide with your exams because we've all been there. And in the end, studying is a big priority for us as well. So hopefully that's not going to discourage everyone too much. Um, the final question is, I'm here, I'm learning, but I'm not really sure what the end goal is. So how can debate help with my career? And this is something that we have had and we have tried to help um, de um, promising debaters or active debaters try to connect with seniors from the debate circuit. So um, we have a lot of very accomplished seniors that are working in uh, fields of business, fields of law. We also have um, I like to call them rare Pokemons because um, we also have people from engineering um, for our medical students who are from various different non English related fields that are doing very, very well in their respective fields and try to come back and help the juniors who are also trying to figure out their ways. Because and this is probably going to be different. I know that a lot of people decide to start debating in their second, third or fourth year or maybe in grad school or whatnot. But I know that the majority of us here are freshmen. We are young. We want we want to know how to do things, but perhaps are not sure how. So um, the Kita Secretariat has also planned different events where we're able to reconnect past generations to the present generation. And um, hopefully your individual societies will also have some alumni network where you're able to connect with people that have debated in the past and are perhaps working in um, fields of finance, fields of accounting, fields of business, fields of, um, I don't know, like for me, it's translation. So whatever field that you are invested in, you're, you are interested in, you're probably going to be able to find someone that is able to help you with these things as well. So yeah, I, I, we realized that the previous slides were a lot focused on who Kira is and what we do, but these are things that perhaps are also interesting to you because they're individual concerns that you may have had regarding your English skills, about your experience debating or um, with your career as well. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully we will be able to see a lot of you for next week's rookie tournament. That's the biggest new event that's happening this spring semester. And we highly encourage everyone to participate, whether it be um, new um, rookies that, are, that want to debate or perhaps seniors that are helping out um, by judging or um, organizing or whatnot. So we really hope that um, you're able to do that with you. Um, before moving on to the show debate, are there any other questions from the audience that we that you want to ask? Questions? Okay, in that case, I still I think we're still missing a couple of people. So I see Harin, I see Yongwu. I see Suyeon and I see Chuseong. We're missing one person from each team, right? Is Taeyong here? So Taeyong. Okay. I don't think Taeyong's here. Is Yunsong here? Okay. We're going to wait two more minutes for these show debaters to join us and then we'll start right away. Thank you for your patience. Um, also, just one minute before the round starts, don't forget to vote for the team that you think won this round. You can vote to Chuan. Uh, her name is Kira Secretariat on Zoom. And we will pick five of you and give you presents, gifts for participating as well. So yeah, um, I am going to be going over uh, how I viewed the round and um, perhaps clashes or arguments that um, are going to be 
um, important for um, newbies as well. But if any of you uh, want to practice judging for the rookie tournament or judging for sessions in general, I encourage that you also write down what's happening in the debate and try to think of justifications for which side won. Um, yeah, and I think we're still waiting for a couple of people. We'll start as soon as they're here. Okay, we have everyone. Um, just, I guess, a reminder or a um, question, Jamshi? Yeah, I have one question. Thank mm -hmm. you for giving a question. And the question was, will you also upload this uh, debate session into your YouTube channel? We will. So we are going to get the consent from the debaters and upload the, the full video. So anyone that wants to watch this video again, you will be able to do so. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I uh, guess one um, thing that I would like to request from the debaters, we would like to see where you are. So could you put gov or op in front of your name so that we're able to see um, which one of you are the show debaters? I think all of us have different ways of writing down our names and it'll be helpful if you turn on your video as well. Thank you, Taeyong, for setting a reminder. So yeah, if you're a show debater, please turn on your video so that people can see who you are and what you look like and perhaps see a more visual representation of how you debate. Um, yeah, and moving on, um, Chuan is going to introduce the debaters. Um, hi again, before we actually start the show debate, I'd like to just briefly um, organize AP debate process as you guys have already learned in your first sessions. The debate will start from Prime Minister, Leader of Opposition, Deputy PM, Deputy LO, and then we're going to move on to Gov Whip, Opposition Whip, Opposition Reply, and then Government Reply. We have three speakers on a team, six people in total. We will have reply speeches today. And after debate, Chihi will going to do oral adjudication by an adjudicator. So oral adjudication is a process of the judge announcing the winner and explaining and justifying the verdict and receiving questions regarding his or her decision. So to introduce from the first speaker of government, she is Harin Oak from YUU. She is the open grand finalist and third best open speaker of the most recent um, Korean nationals British parliamentary um, competition. She was a freshman, but she has made an astonishing debate career last year. So yeah, I hope you guys really enjoy her speech. Next is Yoon Song Kong from Skeda, ex-HDS, Huffs. Um, he is a 2018 Kira Open pre semi finalist, also a grand finalist of 2018 Sogang Open. He kindly requested to add um, <laughs> joining uh, joining Songkyungwan University uh, business uh, major, and he yeah made it through. So congrats on that. Next is Cheyoung Seo from Edis. Um, she is a quarter finalist of Fall Sogang uh, rookie, rookie Tournament. So Sogang Rookie Tournament is a former format of Kida Rookie Tournament. Um, she was also quarter finalist and eighth best speaker of Spring KNC, and she um, served as Edis, Edis president. So Edis is a debate society of Ihua University International Division um, Debate Club. So she was president there. Next is Chu Song Jung from CUDS, Chungang University. He was a semi-finalist in 2018 Kida Open and also a grand finalist in 2019 Winter ADI Kida Pro-Am and 2019 Asia Debate Open Chengdu. Next is Suyan Lee from KUDC. She's a semi-finalist and 10th Open Best Speaker of also the most recent KNC. She was also a corner finalist in Kira Open and SDS NADC and um, Sawbridge KNC. Um, also, she is a Deputy Chief Adjudicator for the IDS Kira RT that probably all uh, participants here will gonna participate in next week. So you're gonna meet her there. Um, Youngwoo Park from HDS, he was a grand finalist of 2018 Fall Sogang Rookie Tournament and EFL grand finalist of Edis KNC 2018 and he was also a semi-finalist in 2021 KUDC KNC. Also, he is a IDS Kida RT Deputy Chief Adjudicator, so you guys are going to meet Suyang and Youngwoo next week on the Zoom. Lastly, uh, our chair adjudicator is Jihyun, YU slash HDS. She was a chief adjudicator in the CUDS Open, Kira Open, and deputy chief adjudicator for 2019 KMADC KNC, which was the last um, offline VP KNC, which was really fun. She was also a best adjudicator slash invited adjudicator in Taipei Niao. She was first best adjudicator in KNC, Snood Ivy, Kira Open. I'm 
really sure you guys will gonna enjoy Jihee's verdict and adjudication and the answers that she will gonna give to you after the debate. So the motion reads, this house believes that university courses should be proportionately subsidized, for example, scholarship and funding according to the employability of the graduates. On government, we have Harin as Prime Minister, Yoon Song as DPM, Chae Young as government whip, Yoon Song as government reply, and for leader of opposition, we have Chu Sung, DLO is Su Hyun, up with is Young Woo, and reply is again Su Young. Chair is Ji Hee Yoon. And from now on, Ji will gonna have a floor and run the debate. Okay, thank you, Chua. Uh, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to look at the motion. Um, yeah, can you hear that screen again, please? Um, yes, and also this is something that especially um, rookie debaters should also know. We have, um, I guess, a direct way of engaging in debate called points of information or POIs. And normally in offline settings, you would, you would stand up and raise your hand and give POIs. That's not possible here. So um, I would like every speaker before they begin to, um, yeah, before they begin to um, tell us who's going to, how they're going to accept POI. So this can be through chat, or this can be by verbally saying it um, by unmuting their mic. Um, I, and apparently there is a mistake in the speaker order. Sorry for that. So Harin is going to be deputy prime minister and Yoon Sung is going to be prime minister. Is that correct for golf team? Okay, we'll make sure to, um, we'll make sure to change this before the debate starts. But thank you for telling us that. And yeah, I'll be timing the speakers, but please make sure to um, time yourself as well. I'm not going to be writing down anything after seven minutes and 30 seconds. And um, we're not going to, and just a reference, speaking for eight minutes does not mean that every eight minute counts. It's going to be a matter of how you're able to speak during the seven minutes that's given. Okay, under the motion, this house believes that university courses should be proportionally subsidized according to the employability of their graduates. I'd like to invite the prime minister to begin this case for government. You're here. Well, does the timer start when I start speaking? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Madam Speaker, I think the important regards that we have to understand in today's debate is what team, what team brings out more degree of change. I'm talking about tangible changes, not just ideological changes, but rather society. We have to shift the societal norm where accepting, you know, more employability is a better thing for the society and individuals. In team government, we're going to try to prove that yardstick and why that applies to us in a much, much more better situation. Now, we have to understand the style of today's debate. There are two folds. The first, first thing we have to understand about the status quo is that there is a highly inaccurate allocation of funding. I'm talking about some classes getting canceled because they are not either essential or they they hadn't have the essential of funding and some class essential classes are difficult to register because they have too little opening because there were too little funding or just too little pie that people could share right i think this gonna be uh, i think this, this is going to change in our model motion i'm going to tell you why and second status quo madam speaker is that so many graduates don't don't get a job. I think it's a waste of individual time and societal capital to begin with. You know, to, in order to change the uh, the jam status quo, we have to understand uh, what kind of motion we're talking model we're talking about. This we're going to implement funding. We're going to implement scholarship in terms of courses and majors by doing a survey or statistics which classes the graduates who got employed right away took and which department they were located in. You know, we were probably going to talk about STEM related areas or fourth industrial revolution, you know, related jobs, data, data scientists or AI scientists or not. Now, let's we have to understand in today's debate, our first argument would be understanding the role of the university. I think this is a very important thing. And this is going to be divided into two levels, you know, divided into individual levels, how it helps individuals, and secondly, how the societal level. Now, in terms of individual level, university is a place that gives you social mobility, right? It, give, it provides you a chance to change your life. But however, when you don't get a job right away, you're piled with debt and you cannot get a job. Even with a degree, I think students studying humanities or linguistics can really go up the social ladder and make the change that they had anticipated Point. throughout studying. They, throughout studying in high school. And I think this is a very simple market level analysis, right? We have to 
understand that demand for liberal arts is high enough, but whereas the supply is super high, so the discrepancy triggers more competition without more room of in, uh, uh, you know, liberal arts majors to come in. Therefore, they starve. I think the understanding of this crippling debt is really important is because when you have this cri crippling debt, it, make, it makes individuals feel super insecure about their own selves and really can provide you know, a sustainable change to their life. But what happens in our model, right? We, we, we make individuals pursue classes and majors that are good for getting a job. We're talking about, I told you about STEM areas, computer scientists or not. Therefore, they can get employed right away, especially with the help of government fund, uh, university funding them and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, promoting these courses. I think this will actually help individuals to get informed about the choices that they are about to make and thus, you know, make meaningful changes in their life. Why, why is this good? Why is paying off their crippling debt and why is getting a job right away is really important, right? Because the, when you have a lot of money in your hands or when you get money and when you get employed, individuals become more free and more free of making their own choices and thus leading to you know, self-actualization, is, which is very important, right? When you are poor and when you have to meet you know, the basic needs what Maslow's hierarchy describes, you can't really have a lot of room in your mind to actually improve, uh, explore, explore other arenas of your life. But when you have a lot of cash, when you have some you know, kind of mindset that allows you to do so, to explore the other parts of your life, I think that's very when you actually start to look at things in a different picture, in a different framework to understand life. You know, the reason why the young people don't really have an interest in politics is not only because they're just, you know, they're not in interested, but rather they don't really have a lot of time or money to do so. But when you know, these courses and pushing these courses to young university students happen, they get employed right away. I think that's when systematically change, systematical change has happened because young people will be much more interested in politics and educational politics to change and change the societal narrative to understanding this kind of education is much more important. And I think this is very important for individuals. But before that, yes. All right. The reason why people cannot currently find job is not because like, you know, they are undereducated, but it's rather because society has less opportunities open for these graduates. So why is it pressurizing these people necessarily solving the root cause of unemployment that you want to solve under your site? So I think this is a comparison that we have to understand, Madam Speaker, because even even if what team opposition is trying to imply, they're not going to have a lot of a larger place for individuals to get employed, but rather we're increasing the possibility of getting employed. I think that's a very important decision distinction we have to understand. Now let's look at the societal level of the United University's role, because the most vital role of the university is not only printing out you know, peoples with diplomas, but rather contributing to the the society moving together with the society is important that's why government funds universities and corporations funds university not only to make you know people with diplomas but rather trying to so form a social narrative that we are all in this together thus we have to move together with the outcome that has been provided by the universities right so we're talking about you know current dire problems let's take, let's take an example of our current dire problems right for example global warming you can't solve global warming and water shortage by deploying uh, philosoph philosophy majors in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, sub-Saharan sub Africa, but rather we need actual scientists to make a tangible change. And I think when the society pushes or the university pushes individuals to actually form this narrative where STEM, uh, STEM education will make the society better, will make your individual life much more better. I think that's when we can actually make a tangible choice because we are supplying much more number of these individuals to be employed in very different sectors in today's world. Uh, I think I kind of solved the problem what young will kind of uh, says because when the society as a whole gets interested in this problem and invests in this problem, I think that is when the pie gets bigger for individuals to get, to get uh, to get employed or much more educated. And the second part we have to understand about societal level is that, you know, uh, I think uh, actual intangible change happens when people become in interested in these actual effects of the funding of these vital courses. I think that's when individual actually acknowledges the importance of science and some of these courses in universities and to provide a society or change the educational policy to be frontiering to these uh, science-based jobs or science-based education that can actually make tangible choices in, uh, later in society. So at the end of the day, we have to think about which, which side brings up much more utility 
to the society and make actual change. So for these reasons, I'm proud to propose. I thank the Prime Minister for their speech. The speaker spoke for seven minutes and 16 seconds. To start the case for opposition, I would like to invite the Leader of Opposition. Here, here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Chair, the first thing we have to establish is ask the question about what the sole purpose of university is. Yes, we do agree with that employment is, is important, but we think school is also a place of learning and because that's the way it was founded and it allows people to discover new parts about themselves and about society that they didn't know before. And it's the frontier of garnering new research and new understandings of this world. School used to be a place of gathering people of knowledge so that they can have new discussions and find new sparks and innovations and new understandings of the world by bringing people together and conducting more research on things. This leads to things like social movements. Most social movements have had the backing uh, at a major backing because the greatest advocates and the activists were the pioneers and they were the ones leading, leading the social change of injustices. You can see this happening again and again, even right now in places like Myanmar and every social movement had a huge backing of student bodies. And this is because universities are the places where they educate students on things that they didn't prior understand about things like social justice and humanities and liberal arts courses that give people more understanding. And it allows people to gather together, not purely just to gain more understanding about employment, but it's a place where people can get together and have new discussions. It's not purely about money. It also leads to things like, you know, research on archeology span that we might've thought was useless, leading us to research in things like Fear of Evolution or Yuval Noah Harari's uh, Homo sapiens series. It even leads to, you know, it's very cliche, but even leads to people like Steve Jobs that, that might've thought thing, courses like typography pretty handwriting courses were very useless, but people like him were able to connect the dots between very arbitrary and random studies and bring value to society and value to people by connecting these so-called unemployable courses. If we allow students to freely take courses that they're interested in, we think they'll have a much greater incentive to put more attention and put more focus on these courses because they're interested in these courses. And so we think school should be a place, yes, about learning, I mean, that's about employability, but also learning more about themselves and learning about um, to connect more dots so that they can understand more about this world. We are trying to find a world where we can try to balance the two rather than push only employability towards schools. Um, my first point is highly important, uh, Highly employable courses already get huge amounts of funding, contrary to what the prime minister had said in his speech. We look at courses like, um, like computer science, we look at courses like engineering and even um, business schools. They have huge funding, not only from their school because it gives the students the most amount, it gives the school the most amount of money, but they also get huge amounts of money from alumni because they have the system where if an alumni has graduated from that school, and if they give more money to that school and that business school does better or the engineering school does better, it means that their fame gets higher because they went to a school with a higher, uh, higher standard, standard of education. So schools that have, biz that have successful alumni already get huge funding. They also get funding from corporations. You see Korean universities and Western universities all get funding from all these huge corporations like Samsung, LG, Busan, and all these places. But they're only focusing on courses like computer science, courses like engineering. They're not focusing on humanities and arts and history and archaeology and all these courses that might not make them enough money. But we already talked to you about how, even though it might not give direct monetary incentive to the universities, why it's still crucial and why it still adds a huge amount of value to the schools. The reason we don't know that this will happen is because it hasn't happened yet. We don't know what the next art uh, majors will do in the future because they're the new pioneers of expanding our understanding of arts. They're the new ones expanding the knowledge of, I don't know, typography, expanding the new knowledge of history. We don't know any of these. We shouldn't 
um, shut these, we shouldn't disincentivize students from getting into these courses because we don't have a prospect of how much it, how much value it adds because it probably will. We just don't know what to what degree and in what kind of field. Um, we think regardless of school, we think like our POI said, the problem of employability is not a school's problem. We think it's the job market's problem. And this is a problem that the government should take care of instead of universities dealing with the problem. The job markets are getting smaller and no matter how high we stack up students from universities to try to have the best courses and become engineers and become computer science, science students, we think these students already have an extremely hard time getting into um, jobs in the current market because there aren't enough job forces. The job forces is shrinking, not only because of the economy, but because those skills you have to learn anyway in the job forces, but also because job forces are being taken over by automation. Truck drivers are starting to lose their jobs because of um, self-driving cars. Uh, most service industries are shrinking. Most jobs are being taken over. And we think if the job force is getting smaller anyway, regardless of the situation of how educated the student becomes in engineering, how educated the student becomes in employable jobs, the job market is shrinking. So we think it's actually the government's responsibility to incentivize and somehow bring money back to the people and make allow people to have jobs not necessarily in engineering and not necessarily in, uh, in computer science. Uh, this can come in various forms and we think it's up to the public to decide, but just as, a, just as an example, we think this can come in forms of, for example, UBI because it, it just straight up gives people more money or it can come in forms of proper education outside of universities um, to give people skills to understand better about job markets. We think it's the government's responsibility. Up, the government side talks about social ladder and we think this point directly clashes with our idea that yes, social ladder is important, but we think it's the government's responsibility of allowing people to climb these social ladders because courses like computer science already garner so much funding already. And if we put more focus and more funding, because funding is limited, of course, right? Funding is limited. There's only so much you can put it in certain areas. So if we put so much funding in, in computer science and engineering that we already have, we think places like arts, places like humanities, these fundings will shut down and the, the courses and the department will get extremely small. Like go to your school, please go to your school and look at the building of your art school. It's a terrible 50 year old building that nobody goes inside because only art students go inside. Go to the engineering building. It's fancy new technology, best lights, best everything. We think money should instead go to arts rather than engineering because there's already way much, way enough money there. Thank you. I thank the Leader of Opposition for their speech. The speaker spoke for seven minutes and 45 seconds. To continue the case for government, I would like to invite the Deputy Prime Minister. You're here. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Great. So I use pronouns she and her and POI, so you can just unmute yourself and I'll take it. Uh, so my time starts in three, two, one. Education serves as a mechanism in which individuals contribute to contribute good to society. With that principle, I'm proud to stand in a signed government. As the DPM, I'm going to do three things. First, clear up the burdens in this round. Second, rebut the opposition case. And third, build the government case. So now let's go into the first point regarding the burdens, especially in these this house police motions that ask us to make a value judgment. We must establish a clear trade off. The clear trade off is uh, I'm going to present it right now on the government. We are advocating for adding employability of success of students into the equation that determines the financial administrative policy that the university bursar is in charge of. On the opposition, they're advocating for the fact that regardless of the success of the students, just allocate the resources based on the pre existing formula. With that being said, what side government needs to do in order to win is first justify the reasons why allocation of resources should be dependent upon the success of the students, but then secondarily, why this particular incentive of subsidization is good. What opposition needs to prove in order to win is why this form of incentive is bad in achieving such in, in achieving solution to such problem. So then therefore, I also want to bring up the status quo analysis that the prime minister has come up with that leader of opposition did not really engage with, right? 
the reason why we have things like subsidization is because to solve some things like market failure, right? That's when the typically government actually uses things like government subsidies. In the case of this motion, what is the failure that we're talking about? In this quote, the jobs that produce the highest employability, such as medical school or engineering majors, tend to have the lowest acceptance rate and ambitions and the highest cost of tuition, despite the ever-growing demand for them by the society and by the applicants themselves and also the students. We to actually ameliorate that problem, we do think that this is a right problem and solution that needs to be addressed. However, we also think that on the side of opposition, they're keep what the LOs keep saying is that we must allocate much more money into this art, uh, arts, I guess, majors or like this art programs or courses. However, we don't really hear the competing analysis as to why necessarily the STEM fields needs to be like the funding that they get needs to be lowered, especially given the fact that there are so much more demand for the students who are interested in taking STEM classes, right? So then let's actually rebut the opposition case. The POI that was raised by the opposition asks that there are other, other factors that result in unemployment. However, we tell you that university's interest is catered towards the interest of the students. More students want to take these courses that result in higher job employability. This is empirically true, like things like medical schools and engineering versus like arts fields. This is why the side government still outweighs, even if we are not able to solve the root cause of unemployment, because solving the root cause of unemployment is probably outside the context of this motion. And the main stakeholder here is the relationship between the students and the administrator at the university. Then they talk about how university is a place for learning. We both agree. We think that university is a place for learning. However, the comparative is, is this incentive justified? What side opposition needs to do to win this argument is outweigh the principle of not altering what is quote unquote value by the society over mechanization of over mechanization of employment over leaving the resources allocation for the sake of individual needs. However, if you really think about this we're still educating students right it's not like side government is getting rid of this art department no that's not what's happening we are not getting rid of archaeology research rather where is the supply headed towards now because leader of opposition did not challenge prime minister's argument that there is an inefficiency that is happening in the status quo with resources regarding these classes getting cancelled if that's the contextualization then the students will not suffer that much then they talk about how like there's going to be high in employment courses of already get a ton of funding. Sure, it's you know huge, but uh, no, thank you. But it's all relative, right? Like what leader of opposition is saying by quote unquote, a lot, is that really sufficient for the institutions to help these aspiring students claim seats in those classes and enroll in it? That's the question. We say it is not enough. Ello's analysis regarding function, uh, funding, specifically for STEM fields, fields, is shallow because people in the arts and museums can still donate money and scholarship and internship opportunities to the students who are interested in such field. All we are saying is that we alter the way in which the subsidization of funding goes to these uh, high demand fields, but we're not necessarily stopping these low demand fields from getting the jobs or like i mean not jobs getting the funding in the first place then lastly they talk about how the unemployment is a problem that the government must take care of okay no thank you there are there the government is already doing this with a government uh, sponsored job print training programs however those are not the most applicable to the stakeholder of this motion which is the tuition paying students these stakeholders the tuition paying students are not going to ones not going to the ones who are taking their weekends off going to the government and learning how to like actually learn these like government training jobs right this means that the very fact that the LO recognizes that there's a need for government intervention, that necessarily states that they recognize there's a problem and the incentive is needed. We think that in the case of this motion, given the contextualization, that place to be happening, the change, the place where the change needs to be happening is within the education system itself, not outside college programs. So now let's rebuild a case for the government side. Now I want to talk about first um, why we think that principle, uh, why we think that this sort of um, I guess change of funding is necessary to meet the demands of where society is headed towards. Because we think that the interaction between education and society should be, should be that individuals, especially university students, do have some sort of obligation and responsibility to contribute to the society. Since they benefit from the goods that the society proved them in some other ways, such as a public education and like public facilities, right? This means that employability is a mechanism course, and yes. uh, it's a mechanism towards actually gaining that work to actually give back to the society. And when you're employed, you 
you know, you know, pay taxes, you contribute to the service economy that members of the society benefit from. Second, is the subsidization the right good to be advocating for? We think yes, because A, this is not a bad form of incentive. Notice that it's not like there's not like a negative stigma attached to these high employability fields. Rather, it's a good incentive for individuals to meet the financial needs to gain education that shows high correlation with job success. This makes the students trust in the very importance of post-secondary education institutions. And I noticed that a lot of the, some of the low income students may just like not have any faith in this education, like post-secondary education system itself, because they feel that, oh, it's not worth going. But however, we sort of mitigate that harm. But then secondarily, notice that at its best, this incentive does not harm individual values significantly. We are not penalizing students who do not enroll in these courses. Rather, the very fact of the matter is the price difference that already exists in the status quo and the select group of students who will be incentivized to be taking these classes. But those who wish to study the fields with low employability can absolutely do that. But then thirdly, but this could be a good for the good thing for overall society because um, as the simple as the simple system is like implemented, let's say, the state is likely to offer much more money into supporting public education to the public universities because the state already wants more workers in the field with high demand, right? This means that the high employability of the courses in public universities may receive much more funding in the end to make the ends meet. Therefore, proud to propose. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for their speech. Uh, the speaker spoke for seven minutes and 18 seconds. I would like to invite the next speaker, the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Here, here. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. Start in like 20 seconds. Okay, my time starts in three, two. Even at this point of this debate, I'm still incredibly unclear of what the government team wants to do today, right? So I like, are they going to say that like our industries and like these humanities industries are going to like die off and that's okay? Or are they saying that like these um like business schools or like STEM majors have less funding, right? It's incredibly unclear of how their model is actually going to address this problem. I think that they're already losing. So I'm going to address three things in this today's debate. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the status quo and why their analysis of the status quo is like simply untrue to begin with. But secondly, I'm going to deal with the practical harms of this policy and how this policy actually aggravates the problem that is already existing, the status quo. And third, I'm going to uh, like present our team's last substantive about how this changes the societal narrative, right? So starting with our first point about the status quo and what the status quo looks like. So basically the analysis coming from the government team was that like STEM majors and these majors doesn't have like a lot of money and classes are go getting like eliminated and whatnot right so number one we think that this analysis is simply untrue right I don't know which university like the DPM or the PM is like actually going to but when we like actually see the status quo you don't see universities in like business schools or STEM majors like lacking money right even if you see the buildings like you as our prime minister like deputy leader of opposition already mentioned like these art schools or like these humanity schools these buildings are like really old like you don't want to like enter these buildings and whatnot but when you look at these like stem major buildings or business buildings it's really rich and obviously there is a lot of funding even from the alumni and whatnot right and even when it comes to classes when we see the realistic picture in the status quo obviously there are more classes that are in these departments that in, in which the employment level is really high and like these art classes there aren't a lot of classes so it's really hard for students who engage in these departments to even graduate right because they can't listen to the classes that are necessarily for their graduation we think that this problem is already happening in which the these schools in which these employment level is low has less funding as it and is being defunded and the schools who have like high employment um rates have like a lot of funding we think that this is a problem and a situation that is already existing in the status quo they're going to aggravate the problem right but secondly i want to talk more about like how these like they're like 
people, simply people going to these departments more will solve the employment problem because we think that was a very like simplistic mechanism coming from the government team, right? Because when you think about in the status quo, I don't think that the employment level is going to be different from both sides, right? We already acknowledge the fact that employment level isn't a problem of universities. It's like more of a societal problem. And I don't think that's the main delta of the state. Then the problem we need to ask here is what, what will actually happen if like all of the people who go to like STEM majors, right? So the um, the government team argues that like just because like people go to more STEM majors, people will now get employed and everybody will be happy. We don't simply think this is true because like unless the government team is trying to argue today that everybody like loves STEM majors and there is absolutely no like every person like every student in the society are apt for STEM majors. Some people are going to want to go to art majors and humanity majors, but some will like be forced to go into these STEM majors if their case and under their case scenario, right? Then we think that because the pie or the job market isn't going to change, the competition within the STEM majors is going to go up, whereas the amount of employment is go isn't going to really change. And I don't think that this will provide a clear mechanism as to which these people will get employed. We don't think that that like is like, we think that's a very big problem and solution mismatch coming from the government team today. But secondly, I want to ask about like, what is will actually happen to these humanity departments and what is the realistic comparative in this debate, right? So I think that, um, as I explained in our status quo, humanities departments are already being de defunded to a degree where they can't like even like invest in their school buildings or invest in their school classes, right? Then what is the realistic scenario that is likely to happen under their side of the house? We think that humanities departments like are going to like the are not going to have enough money to investigate on their students or like give out internships or like investigate or innovate to a degree where they can improve the rate of their employment, right? Because in, when you see in the status quo, because of this like low employment rates, these like humanity departments actually want to innovate their departments to a degree where they can cater more to the employment needs of their students, right? But we think that this is going to be extremely hard under their side of the bench because frankly, even, even if like the humanities um, department is trying to do so, they can't do so if they're defunded and whatnot. Right. So we think that this isn't going to happen under their side of the house. Then what is the comparative in this class? Right. We think that the comparative is this. We think that under both sides, humanities education and linguistic education is going to exist, right? Because obviously the government team isn't suggesting that everything should go away. Then we think that they're under their side, humanities departments will be defunded to a degree that can even like provide their students with better like opportunities for in like um, internships or like job opportunities. They can't provide students for innovation or whatnot. And this is really harmful because humanities students often have to like build their own specs in order to like get employment in the status quo, right? And we think that this is going to be extremely hard because if they can't be provided of scholarships, like poor students will ha now have to do either or like part-time jobs in order to fund for their scholarships. And this actually like limits the time of which they can invest for their future, right? But secondly, the, I think the second impact of this is it also makes students from other departments listen to like the Kuyang Sob in these departments, right? Because when you see in the status quo, many linguistic departments actually open Kuyang Sob or like cultural these classes for other department students. So these other students can actually engage in these students and learn about what their interest is and learn about these important traits in humanities, right? We think that this is extremely going to be hard under their side of the house because now now these departments are going to be defunded and they wouldn't have the opportunity to hire new teachers or hire new professors to actually open these classes. We think that this actually lowers the whole quality of the universities in the status quo. And we think this is bad because obviously like there are going to be a demand of students who want to listen to these cultural like cultural classes in the status quo and we can't now cater to these interests but secondly we think that this is bad because we think that humanities does have a value in and of itself it ha helps solve the moral discussions that go on within our society about how like we should balance the technological developments and the human like philosophical questions that are existing in the status quo right the thirdly i'm going to present our team's last substantive about how this actually changes the narrative within universities right because like i think that this happens in two ways number one the point of which you explicitly explain how like you the point of which you explicitly explain now we're going to act actually give fundings only to the departments that are good for employment is the point of which you explicitly, explicitly set the storm of how universities are only for employment and employment only, right? This is really bad because um, one, this, it, this actually changes the current norm in which universities have provide this like field for students to study in their own interests. But this is also bad because this is obviously going to trickle down to other fields within society. You know, like for example, philosophical um, discussion fields or political fields. And this is going to create 
create a big imbalance and a landscape landslide to only the STEM majors that are important, right? But secondly, I think that this is also going to make it difficult for people within the same like different departments to interact with each other because already there is this normal like and people are like um being some students feel superior to other students. We think that this is going to be aggravated for all these reasons. We're more than proud to oppose. I think that puts the opposition for their speech. The speaker spoke for seven minutes and 37 seconds. I would like to invite the next speaker, the government whip. Here, here. I'm sorry, I think the screen just froze. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if it's my problem. And now it's better. Now it's better. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I hope that doesn't happen again, but I'll just start. Okay. Mr. and Madam Speaker, I'm pretty sure you all have experiences where you had to take a certain kuyang, but then you couldn't take it because the TO was too small for you to actually click your way into that class, right? For example, I need to take computing job sakua. Programming, this computing course that the school require me to take. However, I still have not taken it even if even when I'm a junior right now because the school didn't want, the school didn't have enough computers for me to click my way into that course. I think the current problem that we're seeing is that universities don't have enough facilities to give, uh, to fulfill the demands of students for some courses. And in many cases, these courses are the more employable courses, or at least what we're currently calling the STEM courses. So let me talk more about our arguments. But then before moving on, I'd like to talk about some wrong characteristics that the opposition has had for this whole round of debate. So when PM comes up to you, to the podium and says that what's so important is the degree of tangible change and nobody goes against this throughout the whole debate even up until this point this like my speech i think what we all expect is for the opposition to bring up a certain change in this world because when we talk when we told you that through this we're going to be able to enlarge um tos for like stem courses we're going to be able to get more people hired and make more changes we want opposition to bring up a counterfactual and perhaps a better world right this never we think that when, sure. Sure. There's already a hyper focus of funding towards departments that make a lot of money from rich alumni and corporations where liberal yes. arts, the only source of funding is from the school. You need to defend a case yes. where there's not enough funding from the school because that funding from the school has given taken to engineering. So these liberal arts departments have to either shrink or shut down because they don't have enough students and money. Number one, you guys told us that some people still want to do liberal arts because some people are interested, not everyone's fit for STEM, right? That means that liberal arts still has a demand in the society and they have their supply. So no, they're not going to be shutting down. But then also secondly, even if that does happen, you don't think that that's a problem because if the society called for more STEM graduates, what's wrong with fulfilling that natural supply and demand of students in the employing and job market? So moving on to the wrong characterization that opposition had as a whole. Number one, they characterize university students as students who want to learn like calli calligraphy and Thing, right? We think that this is partly and from government bias, totally untrue because university students naturally have the incentive to learn more about things, to want to learn more about things that that's going to get them hired in the future, right? I'm not spending something on per semester and I'm not spending four years of my life in university to uh, get a diploma that's not going to be held for me at the end of my graduation. I want to become hired and that's why I'm actually attending university. And keeping in mind these things, we think that there's already a high enough demand, but not enough supply regarding these STEM courses. So if we invest more money into these courses, if we get more facilities and more professors, we don't, we think that this uh, discrepancy can be fixed. And this is a, this is going to be bringing up better changes like our PM and DPM has continuously mentioned, right? But then again, talking about the job markets, we continuously talked about how employment rate is so low and opposition has continuously run out of given excuses for unemployment, saying that university education is not the root cause of this problem. We agree that university education and whatnot is not the root cause of like philosophy majors not getting hired. However, we think that throughout this motion, this is a problem that can be solved, right? So for opposition to claim that this is not the root cause, 
is simply running away from a tangible and also possible solution that we have to the problem. So when we think that even if university education and this type of like allocation of funds is not the root problem, if, if this can be fixed through going through this motion, we think that there's no reason for uh, us to actually or deny this type of uh, legislation happening, right? So we're essentially telling you, Madam Speaker, is that the model we gave to you today is going to lead to more investments in the STEM fields for university education, right? This is going to lead to more facilities. This is going to lead to more professors. This is simply going to lead to more room for everyone to enter in, for the people who are actually interested in STEM fields to go into university and actually take that course. We think that this supply and demand is already not being met in the status quo because students who want to take STEM courses can take it just like my current situation. But then again, even after this level, when people graduate, when people graduate and they're looking for a job, we have a discrepancy of supply and demand in the job market as well, right? This can be also fixed with our model because now we have more STEM graduates from that bigger facility and bigger classes that we made throughout this funding. And now we have this mismatch that's solved. This is, I think, the ultimate and utilitarian benefit that we are able to bring to you as the government. And we have continuously pushed throughout this debate, right? However, opposition has continuously denied this. They have told us that this is not going to be helping. This is not the fundamental problem. But yes, even if it's not the fundamental problem, we think that it's a solution that's viable. And therefore, there's no reason to run away from this. Now, moving on to certain clashes that I found, I think the biggest one was the goals of universities, right? So from opposition leader, leader of opposition, they have told us that the goals of universities is to provide students with education. And I think when they're saying education, they want us to learn about philosophy and humanities, right? We think that this is partly true, but then again, we don't think that there is any inborn value of such education. Or even if there is such inborn value, we think that there are some certain things that need to be weighed over than others. And in this point, that's unemployment because so many high school students, so many university students are concerned about unemployment and they like a lot of people are going out to Alba instead of actually getting a job, right? We think that number one, even if the goal of university is education, even if we bite the bullet and say that this is true, it's even more, uh, this is going to be better on our side because at least we're going to be having like more facilities and more ways to actually teach people, right? So this goal of education is better achieved on our side because we ha actually have more funding for courses that have higher demands, not only for university students, but also for our society. And also to move on, we think that this is what's truly going to work as a social ladder, right? Because the goal of education, we agree, is a social ladder. However, if a poor like, I don't know if a person from a lower social class somehow finds their way into a uh, university, but they graduate with they graduate with a philosophy diploma, that's probably not going to be their ladder. Instead, that would be kicking the ladder away because even with that four years and having Mountain per semester invested, they wouldn't be able to find a job and thus that wouldn't be their ladder, right? But if we are able to widen STEM courses, if we're able to oh, get more students in, we think that this is what's going to be truly a social ladder for the society. And this is the tangible benefit that we are able to bring as government, whereas opposition never really brought up anything prior to propose. I thank the government went for their speech. The speaker spoke for seven minutes and 35 seconds. A friendly, a friendly reminder to everyone that you cannot vote for the winning team until the debate is over. This is not on Inky to Pyo, just because PM said everything he wants to say and the PM speech is over, you, you saying the government that wins does not really reflect the entirety of the debate. So what we're going to do is after the debate is over, we're going to have about 10 minutes um, free time before I begin my verdict. So that's going to be the time when votes count. Think of it as like, I don't know, show me the money. So if you if you post or vote for any team before that designated time, it's all going to be canceled. Um, yeah, I know that a lot of you have people that you're rooting for, but please wait until the debate is over for you to finish giving your, casting your vote. Okay, with that said, I would like to invite the next speaker, the opposition whip. Here, here. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. All right, I'll, I'll just set my timer.
Notice that this debate is a value judgment debate. That obviously there's going to be a finite amount of resources under both sides of the house. The reason why we think that government side cannot win this debate is that the point in which you increase fundings to like more employable courses is correlatively when you have to pull out funding from less employable courses or less employable department or whatnot. Something that the entire government was re like reluctant to engage to. But this trade-off was something that they had to justify in this debate as, as to why is it that the employability must be utmostly prioritized even at the expense of survival of some department department or survival of some courses and because they were un unable to prove that we do not think that they can win this debate the idea of discrep discrepancies that are likely to happen under their side due to lack of funding is exactly why pms like this ambitious line saying that like we need to move together is unlikely to happen because some field and some courses are likely to stay back and whatnot the government side tells us that look course is limited and there, there are students who cannot register to certain Kyoyang or whatnot. We th we do, we're, we're, we're going to partially agree with this particular analysis. But what you have to understand is that under government's world, because of lack of funding, it is likely that these other less employable courses are going to be canceled under their side of the house. What this means is that the inaccessibility would exist under both sides of the house to a certain extent. Rather, in that case, we would much prefer an inaccessibility, at least at the bottom line when we have this balance of courses and balance of department, rather than that uh, inaccessibility leading to only perpetuation of the exist existing discrepancy. The first question that I want to ask in my speech is what exactly is the principal purpose of university? Coming from government side, this entire idea of employability or whatnot, we're going to concede that partially employability is one of the many responsibilities that universities have. But what we told you coming from our side is that the major differentiation of universities and other like job institutions or job like school is that universities exist to amplify the academic researches and whatnot and to cater to diverse interests of students. What you have to understand in this debate is that we tell you that when it comes to like, you know, interest of students, even if society prefers STEM, there will be some students who are still interested in liberal arts like me, right? We think in that case, universities should be able to cater to other forms of interest and other forms of like wants and whatnot. The point in which you have this discrepancy and have this imbalance of funding is exactly when you perpetuate this narrative that we're only willing to support those courses that are employable under government's world. We don't think this is really, this defeats the purpose of like universities to begin with. And GovWiv tries to say that all people can now learn STEM under their side of thousand time. That is something that is good. We think that this is contingent upon the assumption that everybody is like, everybody wants to learn STEM under their side of house. We don't think that's true. For as long as if we're able to prove that there are diverse interests within students is exactly when we're able to cater to these students need something that government side negates to engage with. But government side also suggests that look, like schools have to uphold mobility and like good for society that the three speaker wanted to say no thank you. We think that you like like what my PM like like what my LO told you, you never know when the social change would happen and what kind of major and what kind of profession will be supported and preferred in our society, right? We never knew that fourth industrialized revolution is going to make STEM field be preferred in society. So we don't know when the shift of social trend is likely to happen. And in that case, we think that because we're able to balance the education and professionality of individuals, it's exactly how human resources are there to have our society to adopt and have social mobility, something that governments like also did not engage with. But the next question that I want to ask in my speech is what exactly is the cause of problem is because this was the analysis that came from all speakers of opposition side that the root cause of unemployment happens not because students are not professional enough but it's rather because there is a lack of job opportunity open for these graduates in the society corporations don't get enough, give enough job opportunities to graduates with bachelor's degree the problem the, the thing here is that there you see a lot of like graduates from prestigious university with good gpa still like 
unable to be employed and have to study for things like 7급 공무원 because they cannot get that access to job opportunity. Why is this particularly important? Because even if we buy the best case premise of government side, the people and students are likely to become more professional under their world. The problem is for as long as if there is a, there is a limited job opportunity open for these graduates, what you have under their side is that students would be more professional, but that professionality would not be able to help these students to have them access to job opportunity, which means that they cannot really solve the problem to begin with. And I thought it was very sneaky when government with tries to say that even if we don't like engage with the root cause of the problem, they're still able to mitigate some things, right? But they didn't really prove as to why. When the root cause is still there, why is it the mean why is the problem mitigable? For as long as if society don't have enough job opportunity open for these graduates, Sir? we don't think that employability significantly like increases on their side. Yes. Why is it our problem that our society is not willing to hire philosophers? Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in, uh, in my last, this at this point, right? So I'm going to engage with this idea of employability and give you a comparative. I think that first and foremost, we think that like what my DLO told you, the point in which you full, pull out funding from less employable courses is exactly the point in which they have less ability to equip their students with necessary professions and like applicable to have their academics and professions be applicable to society and reality. Look at a lot of humanity and liberal arts fields currently making an effort to have these like professions and academics or materials to have it be applied to reality. Look at like, for example, like international studies department that actually tries to offer their student with things like internship programs or whatnot. The point here is the point in which you pull out the funding is exactly when these departments have less of a resource to provide for their students with actual tangible like employable opportunity that government side like cried out. We don't think that this actually happens on their side and rather you but the reason why they cannot also argue that we will like continue to give funding to all like department is because also this funding is quite limited that you cannot infinitely fund every department so even if you have an increase in like humanity employability the point in which stem has greater employability then like comparatively is when even if like they improve the situation they still cannot get the necessary funding and also our deal talked about the social marginalization as to how this profession is likely to be overall perceived as unnecessary unapplicable and that is why you have all of these professionals to be to be unable to access to greater opportunity for all these reasons even if this debate is about which side is better in terms of employability i think that we should still win this debate thanks I thank the opposition whip for their speech. The speaker spoke for seven minutes and 32 seconds. To conclude the case for opposition, I would like to invite the opposition reply. Here, here. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. And my time starts in three. There are three reasons why the government team cannot win today's debate. Number one, um, they failed to engage with what the status quo actually and realistically looks like, right? Because as an average reasonable voter in this debate, I think that it's really important to consider what actually does the status quo look like. We have given you the likely and more the, the more realistic evaluation of the status quo coming from our leader of opposition, right? We have explained that in the status quo, whereas these arts and humanities like departments are like already defunded, they don't have buildings, like they have like really shitty, shitty buildings, they're like really old. Like on the contrast, these STEM major buildings have these like high technology technological buildings and they already have a lot of money, right? But then the only like analysis coming from the government team was that like, you know, like um it's really hard to like Sugang Chinchong because like there aren't enough like TOs for students, right? I don't think that actually engages with the realistical status quo that has been presented by our leader, uh, leader of opposition. I think that we're already winning on this point. But we all 
have already told you why the status quo analysis is more likely to be true, right? Because one, we told you that there are a lot of alumni funding in the status quo in within these majors, but also we think that there are a lot of like incentives for students to already opt in into these majors, so they don't have this lack of like collecting students in order to run their department. So we think that the status quo analysis was much more realistic coming from the opposition team. But secondly, I um the reason why the government team cannot win this debate is that they only like cater to like they only seem to argue that the sole and only purpose of universities is for students to get employment, right? Uh, we on the opposition team has continuously told you from the start that the role of universities is yes, to provide employment, employment opportunities, but we have already engaged, we have like, also engage with other priorities of the universities, such as like letting students like learn the things that they actually want to learn, or like um, leading, like having this field of discussion in which students can engage in, right? So we have already proven to you why, like number one, humanities in education is important in of itself. But secondly, even if you don't buy this, there are actually going to be students who are willing to engage in humanities education and why it is also important to help these students and prioritize these students. We think that that was the like main Main role of universities and comparative that was never engaged compared like coming from the government team but the third reason why uh, yeah but like before the third reason but even if we say that even if we take their like best case scenario and say that the sole purpose of universities is for employment and universities should be this like job training like place we still don't they never they cannot also win on this point because they never explain why more funding given to these stem majors is actually going to solve the problem right because their only analysis was that like you know like these um it's hard for these students to like listen to these classes we've already started like from the beginning told you why this is simply not true but the only problem coming from their side was how it's like difficult to like enroll in these classes because there's a limited amount of people. They never explain how like giving more money is actually going to help these like specific problems like Suang Xinchong because obviously that's like more of a problem of Suang Xinchong, right? But the third reason why the government team cannot win this debate is that they simply fail to neg like they simply negate the explicit harms we have told you over and over of what will actually happen if we defund these departments, right? Um, me and Yongwu have already told you from the like already told you that like when you the point of which you defund these art departments is the point of which these departments will not have the chance to innovate, not have the chance to cater to the needs of the people who are actually in these departments for them to actually have a chance of employment, right? We told you the tangible harms of how these students will now have to like um, engage in part time jobs because they do not get the scholarships that they need. And this is also going to trickle down to the social narrative to create a vicious cycle in which students cannot like get a job like these like art and humanities industries are like, um, like not prioritized even in the societal narrative and this is going to lead to a vicious cycle within the universities but then what has the opposition team told you in contrast right we have we won this debate because we gave you the comparative of what is actually the university's role and why is it really important for universities to have a balance of departments right because we told you that humanities education is important but moreover it's important for students to like engage in these variety of activities especially in universities for them to prepare the future and to fulfill Fill the role of universities for all these reasons we think we definitely take took this debate i think the opposition reply for their speech the speaker spoke for four minutes and 34 seconds to conclude this debate i'd like to invite the government reply here here okay so my time starts in three two one who gets what? That is a central question that this debate has been centering upon. So far, what I can see from the side opposition is we don't want our classes to get defunded. DLO claims that our classes are important, but then let's revisit the burden analysis and examine whether each side has actually met the burdens. First, we were supposed to, as a side government, justify the reason why allocation of resources should be dependent upon the success of the students. We believe that on the side opposition, they totally neglect this contextualization of what the status quo looks like that the PM gave you. We all experience a lot of like problem with the course registration for all the STEM students or like any other uh, in the competitive fields that tend to employ, I mean, that tend to result in higher employability. But then secondarily, we talk about why this particular incentive and subsidization is good because it actually opens up much more faith in education system for the post-secondary, especially for the low-income students. And also they feel that this education could be afforded because they're now being subsidized. What opposition needed to prove is why this form of, form of incentive is bad in achieving such, in solving such problems 
problem. Their argument regarding why this would be a problem was based on how art classes are going to get defunded. So let's address that first. It is questionable for opposition to claim that art buildings are too poor I and mean, art departments are too poor. But the question that they have not answered is, do those art courses really carry the same degree of demand as the courses with high employability? The reason why they're defunded, as PM tells you, is because there is a low demand by the students and students typically are drawn to classes that produce high employability, right? The, the general students, universities are not suddenly going to get rid of majors that they're proud of, like Indiana University, which provides prestigious music courses that produce high number of musicians getting hired that is not something going to that means Indiana University is not something going to like start allocating all the resources from that huge like prestigious music department that produces a lot of employment employers to stem fields that means the criterion that determines where the money is headed towards is a success of the departments I mean it's a success of the students or the alumni which takes employability as a huge factor for the general public then the next their next strongest argument is like regarding limited resources right like they talk about how like we don't want the art classes to get defunded but we ask you in order to talk about funding you must consider the demand of the supply that is the most justified framework in today's debate because opposition never gives you any reasons as to why we need such a soft place for arts right buying into opposition case is exactly what pm said even if you pour money into these art classes we are not sure renovating art building with a student population of 20 per class year is going to do much it's exactly the impact of inefficient usage of resources because those classes are going to get canceled anyways later these classes are eventually going to get canceled and the buildings that they pour money on is going to cripple down just like what the LO emotionally described. Even if opposition says STEM fields get a ton of money, they fail to answer the question DPM race. What is quote unquote enough and a lot is relative. We tell you straight from PM, DPM and government with speech that despite the high demand for doctors and engineers, there's too much demand and there's too much competitiveness in terms of getting the courses within those fields. And there's a high tuition cost that actually bars a lot of the students from gaining those opportunities in the first place. Thus, there is a clear market failure here. There needs to be some sort of incentive nor intervention to actually solve this problem within the concept of educational institutions. So then we, I talk, I want to next talk about the problem with uh, the, I guess, like the interaction between education and institutions and the society. I think above all, uh, education institutions need to cater towards the students' needs. Students' needs are examined by aggregated preferences and demands and what, what the students want. And typically, they really want the classes that uh, actually give them jobs, right? However, we feel that there is a minimal engagement on side opposition regarding this analysis. This is important because as employment contribute goods in the society, by engaging upon this relationship between learning institutions and society is important. Notice that the DPM pointed out that ELO recognizes that there is some sort of intervention must be present but then um, the counterfactual that they present is some sort of incentive uh, that's outside the scope of this debate, which I'm not really sure how this is going to play out. But then secondarily, we think that this is a best incentive because it directly contributes to the stakeholders incentive structure. And we also think that there's no clear harm in like actually like getting like these art classes get defunded because that is status quo anyways. So then therefore proud to propose. I think the government reply for their speech. The speaker spoke for four minutes and 22 seconds. Thank you all debaters. Please cross the floor and virtually shake hands. What we're going to do is we're going to have um, break time until 4.10. So from this moment on until 4.10, you should send um, to on the results of the motion of the round, whatever thing you say before that time or whatever results you say after I've announced my verdict, it's not going to be counted when we do the draw. Thank you so much debaters. We'll see you at 410. Okay, hi guys. This is the account that you should send the message. Please send me message on to me. Please direct message me and I'll gonna announce the winners right before we end this open house.
Okay, hi guys, welcome back. We're going to begin the discussion and the judge verdict for the show debate. Um, just a reminder that the voting period for which team you thought won ends now. So we're not going to be accepting any vote that you cast from this moment. Um, but we already have enough um, people voting for each side. And I think it's very interesting to know that it was very quite close. So that's very interesting to see um, from, yeah, from this show debate. Okay, um, again, um, a round of applause for all the debaters that made the show debate possible. Thank you so much for a very interesting round. I think the um, rookies were able to learn a lot from what happened. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to pretend that I was the official chair for that round and give feedback um, just as I would give in a tournament. So this is perhaps to more, I guess, um, um, show you guys what judging is actually like and the kind of judging that you can expect from the rookie tournament itself. So after I go through the verdict and justification and how I saw the round, um, I'll open the floor to anyone that has questions. So people that perhaps voted um, uh, for the different for the other team, you can ask questions such as, oh, what did you think of this argument? Or what did you think of this comparison? Or um, if you have any questions about the round that you want to ask any of the debaters or judges, we would also be very happy to redirect those questions to you guys. Okay, um, so this is how I'm going to give you my feedback. I'll talk about the overall impression I had of the round, then move on to the verdict, then justify my verdict with the clashes that I saw in this round. So for those of you that don't know, clashes are how we would, I guess, come um, structure arguments that were from government and opposition so that they're under the same topic so that we are able to perhaps more clearly compare the arguments from each side. This is something that normally whip speakers would do, but judges would also organize or show the debate um, how it happened in clashes. So yes, I think overall this was quite a good debate with um, both teams able to come up with relevant examples, arguments to support their cases. I think in this um, debate, what I thought was really impressive is how both teams were able to contextualize what happens under both sides of their houses, what kind of problems they think are detrimental to society right now, and how this, how implementing this policy or, or not implementing this policy can help solve this problem. But I think that also, perhaps because there are a lot of examples thrown about and different char characterizations and contextualizations happening from government and opposition, the question that I had in my mind was, is this example universal? universally applicable under both sides is it going to affect um, everyone in society or even the majority of people in society. So I think that had these examples been, I guess, a little bit more linked back to what's happening right now, that could have been a little bit easier for people to, re to relate to these arguments. I think second, and perhaps this was the biggest problem I had with this round, is that is that it was a bit parallel. So the cases for government works under government's model and the cases for opposition works under opposition's model, but they didn't really, they couldn't really coexist or there were problems that it, I don't think either side was really able to explain that their context or their characterization wins over the other side. So it, in um, debate terms, we call this a parallel debate. So parallel is when like two sides of a rectangle don't meet ever. So that's that's kind of the, I guess, um, the picture that we want to make. So I think in this case, had teams engaged in one, an even if case. So we think that this characterization is more likely to happen. But even if that weren't the case, why is it still better under government or opposition model? Or two, the best case, worst case scenario. Because we also think, because as a judge, I thought that this debate was also um, not really, the debaters weren't very lenient to the other side. So I felt like they were very lenient to talk about certain characterizations or examples that were beneficial towards their side, but were also very strict in pointing out the flaws of the other team. In debate, we prefer to do it the other way around. We, we want to say that our worst case is still better than their best case. So when in, in terms of um, giving rebuttals, please make sure that you try to say that we don't think this is true, but even if this were to happen, even if we give them the benefit of the doubt, and this happens under their best case scenario, why it's still better for us to live under our side of the house. Okay, with that said, um, I thought that this debate went to the government side. And this was quite interesting, because according to the survey that we had with the audience, it did lead to the government win, but it was a very close margin. So it was, it was 15 to 12 
for the government side. So I'll explain in clashes as to how I saw this round. And um, I will say that this was a very, very close round. And I do understand that some people could have seen it as an opposition round and perhaps justifications could have happened as such. But this is how I saw the round and how I thought that it was a close but clear win to the government side. So I think that in there were two big clashes overall. First, in regards to the principal justification of what the role of education is in university and in our society. And second, what is the practical harms and benefits that can come from implementing this policy or implementing this motion? It's not a policy motion. I don't think it's right to say it's a policy. So what happens as a result of us upholding this value in our society? So first, talking about the um, principal role of education. And I think this is where both sides were pretty consistent and very, I guess, very strong from the get-go. The first speaker was able to talk about why this principal is the way it is or it's important in our society, right? So what does the government tell us? Coming from the prime minister, they talk, he talks about social mobility, why employment is a very important factor of university students' lives and why the young struggle through things like political apathy as a result of not being employed and why university is the place for us to solve these kind of problems. And we also hear from the deputy prime minister about how students who pay for tuition have some um, amount of obligation or schools have some amount of obligation responsibility for students, for, for them to ensure that these classes that students want are actually being held. And this idea of the of market failure and supply and demand is a consistent argument coming from the government side. What do we from the opposition side? Opposition is also pretty consistent in talking about how university is a place for students to discover themselves, to discover things that perhaps they didn't know that they wanted to do or that they were good at, and giving us numeral examples of how these linguistics or humanity, humanities courses can actually benefit people when they study these courses and how they can create change even if these students themselves did not know that they could create these changes. But I think, however, there were main, that, that there was a problem with this argument in that if opposition is not really able to say that this, this change is always going to happen or that this change is likely going to happen or that this university is a place where this change has to happen, I think at best it kind of works as a wash because I'm not really sure as to what extent uh, universities have to finance or fund these courses when the possibility or the probability of this happening is not really concrete. And I think that to an extent, I do understand where this argument is coming from. If I were to intervene in the debate, I think I could understand and make the point for opposition side. So again, this has no impact on how I judge the round. But if I were on opposition, I think I would have argued more for because um, nowadays these subjects are not um, like independent in and of, of, these, of, of themselves. Uni uh, um, university courses and humanitarian and liberal art classes also have applications in the real wor world when it comes to things like business or when it comes to things like engineering, which is why we want everyone to have some level of basic understanding of how these courses work through. Or second, we can talk about how these things have a high entry barrier overall. There are not as many history or um, anthropology or archeology span courses that are happening um, to the regular public, which is why university is the only place for the, these things to happen. Or things like, because I feel like the LLO's arguments when it comes to, oh, um, social, uh, when it comes to like movements happening only in universities, that could have, that could have moved beyond the scope of just giving examples, but actually providing us to the mechanization as to how this happens, and which is why university is the place that we should not give up these values or virtues that we as people or a society want to have. So I think that was why um, I needed to hear more as to why this value is going to happen more if the opposition pushes for not having this, um, not having this, what is it, the proportionally subsidizing um, policy. So I think that was why for me, the first part of the principal clash went to the government side. But I think second, and this is where I feel like there was a bit of the opposition biting into the characterization coming from the government side. Because we do hear to a certain extent that the problems happening of, oh, um, there are more STEM courses and courses for language or linguistics or whatnot are decreasing, despite into the narrative coming from the government side, that there is a problem in supply and demand, that people want to have more computer engineering courses, but there simply isn't enough. Because I feel like had this not been the case, it could have actually become a more parallel, uh, I guess, example of, hey, we need more computer, we need more linguistics courses. So that could have been the case. But I feel like the contextualization when the opposition team says, oh, courses for language 
classes are or the courses for language or linguistics are decreasing, it kind of feeds into the narrative coming from the government side. So I feel like and there was a better way for you to say that, oh, we like we don't think it's the case that all schools are trying to decrease these things. We think that there's actually more incentive for people to learn about these um, courses from esteemed professors that have um, these accomplishments in these fields, which is why we think it's just a fallacy for them to simply say that language courses are disappearing, I think could have actually helped from the opposition sides model. Um, so yeah, moving on to the practical clash, I think I divided, I divided them into two parts. One, the practical clash I think centered around unemployment for this debate, but second, I'll talk about the stakeholders as to how um, different stakeholders are impacted under which under um, both sides. Talking first about unemployment, because this was a big issue coming up from this side. But I think at the end, it was it was very close to a deadlock, but still won over by government for the reasons that I'll talk about right now. So what do we hear about unemployment happening from the government and opposition side? We hear from the government side that unemployment is a problem and we want to solve unemployment. But that opposition says that, look, the job force decreasing or getting smaller is not the university's fault. So there's nothing that we can do about these issues. And then the government says, while we do agree that unemployment is outside the scope of this debate, or perhaps universities are not directly to fault or blame for the for the lack of jobs in our society, if we're able to say that this helps solve some problems in the in unemployment, then we take this we take this um, I guess clash home. So what do we? I think that in this case, I do agree that neither side is really able to say that unemployment is the a fault or is the responsibility of these universities. But what do I, what I do hear from the government side at least is that there is an exclusive benefit for um, subsidizing these um, classes proportionally in that there are going to be people that are able to utilize this to create CVs or resumes. And this is where people are, are going to want universities to hold these classes as compared to other, I guess, third parties because they're still paying the university tuition to open these classes. So at the end, I do think this was very parallel or I guess like a bit of a one but the government side still takes this clash home. Moving on to stakeholders, what do we hear from government and opposition? The, so I think a stakeholder or an argument that had a lot of potential, and I thought that this could have been introduced a bit earlier, is the idea of humanitarian of humani humanity students and how it's going to lead to a world where even if they want to listen, listen to certain classes, they're not able to do so. And therefore, universities are not catering to their interests of these students. And it's going to cause a vicious cycle where the school is perpetuating a narrative that these um, classes or these students or these professions are not worth it. So the so-called vicious cycle argument coming from, I think, the la la later part of the DLO speech and the OPWIP speech. So I think in this case, I do understand this argument, but I needed to hear a lot more impact as to why this is so harmful to society or to these individuals as a whole. Because if I listen to the previous arguments that came from both sides of the house, we do agree that they are lesser in number compared to STEM majors or people that want to major in engineering or whatnot. Not. So in that case, and I think this is also not a question that is perhaps, I guess, um, difficult for us to ask. In, in cases of do these um, linguistics majors really want to study linguistics or are they just doing so because they want to enter these universities? I think this was a question that I had in my mind. I didn't really consider this as a part of me judging because I think it could sound interventionist, but I think that this was a question that I also had in my mind in regards to then can we really say that these students really want to study linguistics or if we can argue that that is the case what kind of impact they're able to make in our society but I think that it kind of ended at oh it's a vicious cycle that leads to certain harm for certain people and that was kind of it so I think the opposition could have impacted this argument a little bit more but I think that on the other side government side was able to mitigate the harm of this argument by talking about hey look we're not going to get rid of these classes, there are still going to be funds or scholarships or alumni um, donating to these in, to these fields and we're willing to bite the bullet and say that even if it's lesser than STEM cells, STEM or engineering, it's still better off for us because the majority of students want to major in these fields anyways. But I think second, the other stakeholder that I thought was <clears throat> important but not really addressed um, in this route was the argument that was brought up by Deputy Prime Minister about how now this is going to shift the ideas that underprivileged students have about post-secondary education 
education and how it's going to lead them to um, trust the education further in that they're able to rely upon this education to get a job and therefore not give up give up on university education as a whole. I feel like this argument um, had a lot of potential. It wasn't really rebutted by the um, by, by later speakers of the opposition side. So I felt like when we listen to how these stakeholders, whether it be the humanitarian students or humanity students, or whether it be these underprivileged students, I thought that the harms that were afflicted upon these individuals were um, a lot more nuanced or a lot more, I guess, mechanized coming from the government side, which is why in the end, I also gave that clash for the government side as well. Um, so yeah, that's it for my feedback. Are there any questions that the audience would like to raise either to me as the judge or to any debaters that gave the speech in this round? I do think that this was a very interesting round and especially considering that you are going to probably meet education motions in tournaments in the future. I highly encourage that you go over your notes or you go look at the debate video one more time in um, that's going to be posted on our Kira YouTube page. Again, thank you so much for all six debaters. You guys gave amazing speeches and you really showed what it meant to be a good active debater in Kira. So I hope that everyone also was able to learn a lot from this debate as well. <clears throat> okay. In that case, I don't think we have any questions. We are going to be releasing the, pe the, pe the people that won this draw after um, the lecture from Yuntan. So I'll move, um, I'll pass the mic on to Chilon to introduce our lecture today. So hi again. I'll introduce the lecture. So the theme are the, of the lecture today is Intro to Asian Parliamentary. The lecture is Yun Chan Ku. He is the champion and the overall best speaker of the most recent um, Kira Nationals, which is the biggest national champion in Korea. He was also a grand finalist in Solbridge NEADC, which is the tournament, BP tournament that I aforementioned during the introduction. He was also grand finalist of 2020 Kira Open and also another EFL grind finalist in Monash Australis. And he was also uh, has a great experience in adjudication. He was the second best edge in Snuda IV and was a deputy chief adjudicator in Sogang Rookie Tournament. So now I'll move the floor uh, to Yun Chan and I think you can screen share now. Um, yeah, hi, so can everyone hear me? Okay, um, thanks for that <laughs> fancy intro. Um, yeah, so because I'm a very shy person, I'd really appreciate it if you guys could turn your screens on if available, if not, that's fine. So um, my lecture is gonna focus mostly on, I think the theme is understanding debating jargons. Cause I think as a very, um, when I first came into college debating, people used fancy words like comparatives, weighing, or impacting that I had no idea what they meant. So I think this lecture is going to help you understand the feedbacks that judges give when they use those debate jargons. So um, we're just going to cover these four themes. And things that won't be covered today is intro to AP format itself, specifics into modeling. I think this will be covered in other um, society lectures, um, individual speaker roles, POIs, and the motion veto process. So I think I'm eliminating like a half of what's supposed to be an intro lectures, but I really wanted to focus on things that I thought was important in parliamentary debating. So yeah, this is gonna be the things that will be covered in today's lecture. So starting with motion analysis, um, I think the most frequent type of debating motions that you'll face will especially be policy debates so policy debates, as in we debate whether a specific government should adopt a certain policy or not. Um, and mostly these um, policy debate formats come in the form of THW. So this house would do something. But one thing to note is there are also a lot of motions that are practically policy debates, but come in the form of principle debates. So for example, if you look at the second motion that during a pandemic, this house believes that 
businesses that benefited from the pandemic should be additionally taxed. It is coming in the form of principal debates where we are evaluating something, but practically speaking, you're still debating a policy. So you would still expect for a majority of teams to come up with a model or do things that we would normally do in policy debates. But in terms of nuance, and you still want to sound a little abstract when you build a model or build a comparison because it technically isn't a policy debate. So in a policy debate, um, what we call as important is what we call a model. So yeah, a model as in when we implement, for example, the first motion, which is that we would link the funding of schools to performance and standardized exams. What does this linking looks like or what does this funding looks like or what does this standardized exams look like? And the two things that we really consider important in building a model is firstly, making it clear. So, so that, for example, um, in the motion that you just saw in the show debate, by proportionately, do we mean that we'll fund um, courses that like make a lot of employable students or do we want it for it to be the other way around? So for those things that are required in order for both teams to be debating the same motion. But secondly, and more importantly, I think it's also a strategy in which the government can set up the debate in a way in which it benefits their case in which you can preempt some of the arguments that come from opposition. So I think this will sound a little abstract. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a short video of a PM speech that I think has a really good model. And then we're gonna discuss what that speaker tried to do in building up that motion. So it's gonna be this motion that we would link funding of schools to performance and standardized exams. So I hope this works because, can you guys hear the audio? Best way to tell is it audible? Or not okay, great. So, yeah, this is personally my favorite debater that I um watch, grew up watching. So, I hope you guys enjoy the speech. Um, one thing to note is this speech is more tilted towards strategy. So, look at how she strategically builds up the model to preempt some of the most obvious arguments from opposition. Madam Chair, we acknowledge on the affirmative side of today's debate that there are some elements of disadvantage that make it hard for particular schools to perform. However, comparatively, some schools that experience the same disadvantage as other schools are constantly failing their students. We don't think that that's good enough. We think that we've seen programs in the United States that exist within disadvantaged communities, like the Knowledge is Power programs in New York and Chicago, like the Achievement Academies in those cities, constantly performing above the level of other programs in the same type of disadvantage. We don't think that it's good enough for a government to say that just because you are disadvantaged in some way, that justifies you failing your students and performing below your average. So the model that we're going to be standing by in today's debate is functionally an implementation across all Western liberal democracies of the Rediscovery Grants program in New York. And I'm going to step through that right now. The first is that we would institute standardised tests based on the National Assessment Education Progress Tests that have bipartisanship support in the United States. What they test is numeracy, literacy and critical thinking of those students. Once we have seen the results of those standardised tests, we would place schools in comparative brackets, whereby we consider elements of disadvantage like socioeconomic characteristics and like demographic characteristics of those schools. Where certain schools have the majority of students falling below the average of their comparative bracket for two consecutive years, we would place them on a publicly available red list. What that red list would do, Madam Speaker, is firstly bring them to the attention of the state and lead that leadership culture in that school to be supervised and provide them with grants to turn that school around. Where they did not turn that school around over a period of three years, we would remove all government funding to that school and fundamentally redistribute their students and set up that school again, potentially in the future, with a total overhaul of all of their leadership culture. And that Yeah, so that was what I thought was a very excellent model, and I'm, I'll try to explain why. So firstly, in terms of clarity, she 
provides a very specific definition of standardized testing. So numeracy, literacy, critical thinking. And I think also at the very last part of the model, she talks about how if funding is like lost, this would mean that we totally overhaul the school and we close down the school, which means that the model is also in line with what the motion requires the government to defend. But more importantly, I think strat strategically speaking, her model preempts a lot of arguments that could come out from opposition. And I think the biggest argument that could come from opposition is, look, if you are a school with um, low socioeconomic backgrounds where students don't come up to school, they aren't enthusiastic about studying, isn't it structurally unfair for these schools? And to that, she says that we will place schools in comparative brackets and thereby, if you show a very low average within that comparative bracket, you would lose funding. Um, also, I think um, she also preempts that she'll give a chance for the school to turn around for two years. And that also really makes it easier for op, like harder for op to go with arguments like, hey, one day your school's here, the other day your school's gone. Like what happens to these students, right? So I think models can be very important and can be really advantages for a government bench. If you set it out really well, you can preempt really obvious or strong arguments from opposition. But one thing to note is when you try to model out too much things, you enter into what we call a soft line stance, which is you put in a lot of caveats, you put in a lot of preemptions so that you are not really bold. You are not really taking a full enough stance of taking the full burden. So for example, if strategy wise, you thought that you would give like three chances for schools to turn themselves around, then that would also mean that whatever argument you run as government, for example, let's say that um, we think that efficiency of schools are important for academic development, then your argument also gets a lot weaker, right? Because if you give a lot of chances for schools to turn themselves around, that means that the incentivization argument that you run from golf would also become very weaker, right? So this is what we call a soft line stance versus a hard line stance might be if you take this model to a very hard line degree, it would be like, hey, on um, one test, um, we think that if you fail, you would be automatically be closed down, whatnot. That would make your incentivization argument very persuasive because schools will now be feared or will be afraid of every test that students take. But the problem of hard line stance is you sound a bit extreme and intuition wise, the judge might be thinking like, hey, isn't that going too far? Or hey, isn't that going too much, right? So every model should be a very intricate balance between soft line and hard line stances in which you want to strategically put in certain caveats to make your case a little more intuitive. But at the same time, you don't want to do that to the fullest extent because that might mean that the judge might think that you're setting the debate in a very biased way. Or that might also mean that you, the judge might think that you're not debating the motion itself. So I think um, that dilemma in soft line, hard line stances is something that you need to consider when you build up models. And one last thing is, um, note how she uses very real life examples. Um, I don't know what policy she's talking about that was implemented in New York. She probably studied it somewhere in her university degree or whatnot, but by implementing an already existing model, um, it makes it very easier for you to build a very sensible model because those are very experts. Those are very professionals who invest their lifetime in that um, building that model. So by copying or replicating some parts of the models, you're probably making your model a lot smarter. So don't be afraid of using analogies or case studies when you build models. So that's, I think, the special part of policy debates. And the second also very important theme in policy debates is something that we call government fiat, which is Proposition can assume that a certain policy will be implemented, which means that the origin of parliamentary debating is that it was a format that was used in actual parliament. So like politicians coming up and debating. Um, and in, if you think like you're debating as a politician in a parliament, you can't go like, I disagree to this policy because I won't vote against this. I, won't dis I disagree to this policy because my fellow politicians will not give you the money for that, right? Rather, um, you're really debating on the content of the policy, the harms and the benefits that a certain policy will bring out. So this means that the government can assume that they will have 
a certain amount of votes in parliament, that they would have a certain amount of basic amount of funding to subsidize that policy that's given. So for example, um, oh, I changed the motion. So let's say um, in the first motion, this also linked funding of schools to performance and standardized exams. If you go like, hey, if opposition goes like, hey, this policy will receive backlash from school principals and school principals and teachers unions are a huge voting block and therefore politicians won't be incentivized to pass this policy because it would be very, very unpopular to teachers unions. Then the conclusion of that argument is that that policy doesn't exist, right? But then whatever harm you're trying to push as opposition they also go out the window once you argue that this policy can't be passed. So that's kind of erasing the debate. So those are lines of argumentation that you don't want to push for because you're just arguing that this policy is infeasible, but not arguing that this policy is harmful or principally unjustified. But two things to note regarding government and proposition fiat is firstly, just because you have fiat doesn't mean that the implementation will always be successful. So for example, um, just because the government tells people to wear masks doesn't mean that people automatically wear masks, right? Or just because um, the government links funding of schools to performance and standardized exams doesn't mean that this would always mean that the grades of standardized exams will increase in public schools or private schools or whatnot, which means that you can pass this policy in parliament, but whatever that comes after that public response um, response from other entities, you cannot control and you have to mechanize that that would be either beneficial or harmful to um, the implementation of the policy. And second is opposition has a similar amount of fiat power and political capital. So we call this counter propping. So if we can assume that in parliament, um, the political capital for linking the funding of schools to performance is very popular, then we could reasonably assume that that amount of funding or that amount of political capital also exists in opposition world as well. So if you take the second motion that during a pandemic, this house believes that businesses benefited from the pandemic should be additionally taxed, the fact that government can implement this policy probably means that on a society wise, there's a social consensus that rich big corporations should take somewhat of a responsibility to solving the pandemic because they unjustly benefited from the pandemic. So this would mean that probably we could force or incentivize businesses to do other good things, probably on our side of the world as well. Or we could also mean that if there's a social consensus that pandemics are distorting the economy, we could implement other policies to revive the economy of that um, nation that is suffering from a pandemic. So this, what we call a counter prop is with that similar amount of political capital or with that similar amount of um, funding, we could implement another policy that could solve the problem that government is trying to solve. But it should be different from whatever policy that Gov's talking about and should assume a similar amount of fiat power or political capital. So I think um, this is a little complicated um, concept for both modeling and government fiat. So if you have any questions, um, you could ask them now. Mm -hmm. It can't locate um, the mouse. So. I, I have a question. Yeah. So um, why is it harmful for opposition to argue that uh, government you know, policy won't be implemented in the first place? Like, why does that erase the debate? I think that was what you were trying to say. Uh, um, yeah, wait, so, um, let me stop the screen. Ooh. Wait, so, sorry, um, I'll answer that as soon as I can see my cursor. <laughs> uh, oh yeah so the reason why that's out of the spirit of the motion is because that leaves no room for debate right because debating um should be about whether a certain policy is good or bad but if we spend a huge amount of time discussing whether a certain policy can be passed or not, then we have no room to debate whether that policy is good or bad. So there's no really logical reason why we exclude that in debating, but intuitively speaking, we just, as a debating community, want to discuss whether a policy is good or not, rather than dealing with the technicalities of 
how many Republicans are in Congress or how many budget does the government annually have for environmental studies or whatnot. So, um, but could it still be possible to say like, A, like government policy is not feasible in the first place and B, focus more on like the harms of government policy? Like, um, is it possible to like slightly include like the concept of feasibility when attacking the government model? Um, no, I don't think that's strategic because oh. that's the reason why we have the rule called Proposition Fiat. So mm -hmm. we usually don't want to run arguments that this policy is infeasible. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions? Okay. So I think the concept of policy debates become much clearer when you learn the concept of analysis debates as well. And so analysis debates are, you're debating whether a certain given statement is true or not. So because you're just arguing whether star players in team sports do more harm than good to the team, or you're debating whether um, civil disobedience is justified, you don't want to build a model. So for example, just because you think that civil disobedience is justified, doesn't mean that the government comes up with a model of how to ban civil disobedience, right? How the police should do something, how we're gonna, um, legally codify what civil disobedience means because we're not banning something or we're not illegalizing something, but we're just evaluating whether as a society, we think that civil disobedience is justified or not. So we're not building a model, but a definition might be necessary. And by definition, it means setting um, boundaries of a debate or defining specific key terms within the motion that might be a little vague. And therefore we want to clarify to make a clear debate. So for example, in the concept of civil disobedience, will we include things like violence against people? Or are we just gonna include violence against property or blocking the traffic or whatnot? Those things might be up to interpretation. And in that you want to set the boundaries of key terms, but you don't go to make a policy about whether we should have civil disobedience banned or not. Um, similarly, as for star players, you might wanna define what star players are, but you don't want to go like, hey, we're going to legally force teams or sports teams to ban star players, or we're going to put a maximum cap amount of star players that a team can have, because we're not debating whether we should have a policy or not. And one special type of analysis debates is what we call world comparison debates. So world comparison debates is we're debating whether the status quo is better or whether the counterfactual is better. And I think you guys probably heard the word status quo in the show debate we just saw. The status quo is the world that we currently live in. So it's the world as it is. The counterfactual is the, um, is the, what do you call it? Um, is the other partner that exists, uh, the other world that exists, a parallel world exists that the motion requires you to imagine. So for example, in the motion that this house regrets, the narrative of forgiveness is a virtue. If the motion is a regrets motion, then we assume that the wording in the motion is the status quo. So if we are regretting that the narrative that forgiveness is a virtue, then we're assuming that we're living in a world that we think that forgiveness is a virtue. Then the counterfactual world is a world where we don't think that forgiveness is a virtue. Um, similarly, for a prefers motion, this house prefers a world without the concept of a religious belief. We are assuming that we live in a world of, with the concept of religious belief, but in a counterfactual world, we, no, we are living in a world with the concept of religious belief, but in a counterfactual world, we would prefer to live in a world without religious belief. So the prefers world's um, motions usually work the opposite. It gives what the status quo isn't, and it gives the counterfactual within the wording of the motion. So in world comparison debates, it's very important that you explain the chain of events. So with the forgiveness virtue, what are the trickle down effects or what are the chain effects that happened that led to a massive change within society? So for example, with the narrative of forgiveness, our religious principles could have changed our criminal justice policies could have changed, our education policies could have changed. So with this virtue alone, it could lead to very diverse effects in diverse areas. So world comparison debates really require you to imagine what kind of impact a certain change within our history could have had, 
or whether it's for better or whether it's for worse. And one tip when debating a regrets motion is it's really good to think about historical perspectives. So because you're regretting something, for example, narrative of forgiveness, the narrative of forgiveness has probably existed for more than 200 years, um, thousands of years without, within our human history. So we're not just debating forgiveness as it is in the current society, but also like thousands ago, like in Joseon dynasty, how would it have impacted how we view the state or how we view religion? And therefore, throughout that course of history, what kind of trickle down effect that this slight change had on the entire human history or whatnot. So world comparison debates are slightly different because um, it really um, explicitly requires you to imagine a counterfactual world and to, with that imagination, to em envision chain of events and therefore debate whether that's for better or for worse. Yeah. Um, are there any questions at this point of the lecture? Okay. And there are... These, those are the two big type of motions. The rest are slightly minor type of motions, but motions you will probably see at least once in every tournament. So the first other type of motion is what we call an actor debate. So when you look at um, previous um, slides, this house was either the government, if it's a policy debate, this house would link funding of schools to standardized testing, then probably means that the government is implementing that policy. Or if it was a principal debate, this house prefers a world without a religious belief, then presumably this house is the side that's arguing for that. So probably it was the proposition. But actor debate requires you to, to debate in the shoes of a very specific actor. So for example, um, if the motion is this one, um, I lost my mouse again. Okay, you got accepted to a prestigious university with a high tuition. Um, you're unable to pay tuition, cannot pay a job, and are not eligible to receive financial aid nor scholarship. Sponsorships or agreements where a corporation individual finances a student in return for a promise of a portion of the student's future wealth. That entity has allowed you to dictate over the academic and career decisions, where you'll work, what you will study of that student until the age of 50. This house would, this house says you would choose to accept the sponsorships rather than giving up on entering university. So if you look at this motion, the government is not choosing. It's not proposition like you yourself, for example, Kuyuntan choosing to opt into this sponsorship, but you're envisioning your life as if you are this guy who just got accepted into a prestigious university and would you be making that choice? So in this motion, you was an individual that was given in what we call an info slide, which is just a basic description of what the motion is. But in other motions, you are required to defend and be in the shoes of the BLM movement, or you're required to be in a specific government. So for example, the US government or the South Korean government, oftentimes you're required to be the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. So in that area, you're debating in that person's perspective. And therefore, the metrics in an actor debate are usually twofold. First is your self-interest. So whether something benefits you yourself or not. So for example, in this motion, probably if you're government, you could argue that, hey, if I accept the sponsorships, even if I don't get to make my decisions of my own, I still can get a lot of money from going to prestigious university. I can have um, a very good reputation. On opposition, you could argue, look, I think that getting money is great, but as an individual, I want to live an autonomous life. I want to be able to decide whether I work in a certain state or not. So here you're um, assuming a very selfish individual, right? You're thinking about whether you yourself as a very selfish individual thinks that this is a benefit or not. But another perspective into actor debates is what we call duty and moral responsibility. Because in many cases, we also aspire to be very moral individuals, and we assume that we have duties and responsibilities to people around us as well. So for example, if you're opposition in this motion, you could run the argument, look, if you are forced to do certain academic or career decisions, 
there might be a high chance that you might be forced to do immoral actions. So for example, becoming a lawyer and like, I don't know, doing very behind the door stuff or whatnot, that you yourself will be harmed in terms of your moral worth. So um, just in many actor debates, I think there's a tendency where novice debaters only debate on the first perspective of self-interest and um, your harms or benefits. But another perspective is think about what duties you have, think about what moral responsibilities you have, and therefore with that, you could run many arguments. So for example, the BLM movement, um, you could have a responsibility to minorities within minorities. So African-American women or African-American um, gender minorities or whatnot. Other than just benefiting the movement itself, you might have specific duties to specific groups that could also be a very powerful argument in after debates. Um, the second type of other motions is what we call assuming motions. So assuming motions or hypothetical motions are motions that require you to really imagine very impossible stuff in life. So for example, assuming a technology that allows individuals to change their personality exists, this how to legalize it. Or assuming feasibility, this how to massively redistribute intelligence. So in these motions, again, we talked about proposition fiat, right? So in these motions, you don't go like, hey, in reality, you can never redistribute intelligence. That is not a proper opposition argument because even in assuming motions, we still have government or proposition fiat. So you don't question the premise of the debate. You just debate it as if everyone in the world accepts that premise to be true. And in, especially in assuming motions, I think models and definitions often become very important. So for example, massively redistributing intelligence, how are we gonna distribute it? Are we gonna distribute it equally to everyone or are we gonna give more intelligence to the poor? Um, these questions are especially important in assuming motions because this is something that doesn't exist in reality. So without you clarifying these stuff as government, it's really hard for opposition to debate on the same ground as you because everything is very up to imagination. Um, one tip is when you build models, it's really strategic to look for parallel examples in reality. So for example, um, similarly to how can you get counseling before getting um, medical drugs regarding your um, physical state or either your psychological state, maybe we can force people to get counseling before changing their personality traits or for example, when you say redistributing intelligence, you could say, look, we're gonna redistribute it similarly to as to how we progressively redistribute money in progressive taxation. So with that, you can, again, take models that exist in reality and don't really have to use your brain a lot because those models were probably made very clearly and concisely. And one very important thing in assuming motions is you want to maintain an intricate balance between the fiction world and the actual world. So for example, in the first motion, um, I saw this debate when I was a novice um, and I first came into my club, they did this motion as a short debate. And a very impressive art position argument was talking about how this technology will be commercialized and would make people to be unhappy about their personalities. So he gave an example of the cosmetic surgeries, right? Many people say that advertisements from cosmetic companies um, force people to think that they're ugly because by thinking that they're ugly, they go on to purchase those cosmetic surgeries or purchase those beauty products, right? Similarly, this technology would create an industry where people advertise, hey, you probably won't like this aspect of what your personality, come and fix it, right? So that argument for me was very impressive because even if it's an assuming motion, by thinking about very pragmatic stuff like economics or politics or, I don't know, world relationships, you're able to make your argument in a very more sophisticated manner. So again, you have to assume that this technology exists. So you are maintaining your case in a fictional world, but you still want to employ aspects of the real world. And you want to maintain an intricate balance between the fictional and the real world to make very good and impressive arguments. Um, yeah. I think um, some of this point might have been com confusing. So we're ending the motion analysis part. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them right now. Okay, um, yeah. 
So if not, um, we'll go on to arguments. And from this on, um, I'll, I know I'm not a very funny person and probably you guys would be already bored. So I try to incorporate a lot of exercises that you can think of yourself so that you can keep yourself awake. I hope that helps. So in arguments, there are two types of arguments. The first is what we call a principal argument. The second is what we call a practical argument. So a principal argument is based on what we call a principle, which is a general goal or a value that we aspire to. So you should probably envision things that are written within the constitution. So for example, the freedom of speech or the right to vote or the right to property, those are all general values that we consider to be important within our society and therefore goals that we want to aspire to in debates as well. And in explaining principal arguments, one thing to note is principal arguments don't have really tangible impacts. So practical arguments could be things like this policy helps prevent crime. This policy can boost the economy. This policy can, um, I don't know, promote social mobility. Those are very tangible, pragmatic outcomes that are very intuitive to the judge that, hey, this is very important. As opposed to principal arguments are very abstract. When you talk about the freedom of speech, it may be really unclear for some judges, why is your right to speak more important than boosting the economy or preventing crime, right? So for this argument to be equally valued within the debate, you want to explain why this argument or this principle is important. And that is what we call an intuition pumping. So you're pumping the intuition to the judge that this principle is very important. And usually we do that through what we call examples and general explanations. So you give examples of other cases where this principle was important and then you give general explanations as to why this principle is overall important within our society. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna skip this part and move directly on to exercise. So for a minute, um, think about the motion this house would require citizens to pass the test in order to vote. Obviously, if you're opposition, the right that you want to support for is the right to vote, right? Because you think that even if you cannot pass the test, we still think that it's very important for you to be able to vote, right? So you want to intuition pump the idea of right to vote. Um, think about what examples you would use that would illustrate why the right to vote is important within our society and some general explanations um, that you could explain as to why right to vote is important. So um, I'll just give you a minute to think about these um, two parts. Okay, so I think minutes up. Um, does anyone want to volunteer? Is that a sign of volunteering? Um, Chung Sojin, Sojin. Oh yeah. Um, could you. could it could it be argued that like, um, if I'm trying to intuition pump, um, saying that giving citizens um to, like discriminating citizens when it comes to voting would put you know the basic pillars of a liberal democracy you know at risk. It would it would fundamentally undermine the integrity of democracy. And uh, we can see that through examples of like, um, you know, gerrymandering in the United States of America, or like the, the bill that was passed in Georgia yesterday where like, it, it's a crime to provide um, beverages to voters in line. Like, so that basically hinders them um, uh, from, from voting normally and participating in, in the dem democratic process of electing um, officials. So, uh, you know, discriminating citizens on the base base of uh, academic capacity would um, um, hinder um, freedom of speech, right to vote, and that would lead to the impact of democracy crumbling. And it would basically make um, this house uh, no better than what's the status quo of you know North Korea or China, where like um, some individuals have disproportionate amounts of power, and um, the people don't have the um they don't have the capacity to you know fight back and organize i don't know that's um, just yeah random thoughts so i think um 
some parts of it were really good, but I think some parts of it were things that we kind of want to be aware of when we make principal arguments. And that is, we don't want principal arguments to become tautological, so circular logic. So I think um, usually when we impact principal arguments, it's very easy for us to impact it in a very abstract way, that it harms the pillars of democracy or that it crumbles our democracy. But what we really want to prove is why does discrimination based on voting lead to crumbling, a crumbling of democracy? So we want to establish that link rather than saying that those things are identical. So for example, if you use examples of Georgia, like beverage example, I'm not really familiar with that example, but then opposition can come up and say, hey, why is that bad, right? So you don't want to give examples that the other side can easily challenge as well. So I think um, the example that I was thinking of was like, for example, um, we give rights to even ex-convicts, or we could talk about how people fought a lot for the civil rights movement where they asked for voting rights. And maybe a general explanation that you could provide is, look, um, the state is very coercive, right? We are required to follow the law. We're required to go to jail if we violate the law of the state, but we never consent into it if you think about it. I was just born into a state. I never chose to be born into Republic of Korea. I never chose to be born under the state structure itself as well. And the only way in which he justified this unconsented coercion is by the fact that we get to influence the state's decision as well, that we get to participate in that process as well. Therefore, without your right to vote, this coercion is never justified. So explaining principal arguments are therefore really hard because it's giving logical explanations to intuitions that are really hard to explain. But I think uh, following this basic format helps and you'll get the better hang of it as time goes on. But what I really want to focus on today is practical arguments. So practical arguments are arguments without, with quite tangible impacts. And unlike principal arguments, they're really harder to, they're also very hard to establish because diverse things can happen when it impacts the result of a certain action. So usually we divide practical arguments into two parts. First is what we call a mechanism. Second is what we call an impact. And I think you guys heard a lot of this word going on in the show debate we just saw. So I think that would also help understanding the concept. So mechanism is explaining why something is true. Impact is explaining why something is important. So usually we say that a strength of an argument is multiplying the mechanism and the impact. Because for example, if the mechanism is zero and we can't prove that something is true, no matter how many minutes we invest to explaining that this is important, if we can't prove that this is true, it has no value, right? Similarly, if we prove something that is true, but it has no impact, for example, like I go on to buy a strawberry ice cream and I mechanize why that would be true, but that has no impact in reality, right? Then that also is a very useless argument. So you want to make sure that you do both of these things in practical arguments. And this is just the formula that I um, made when I first entered into college debating because I thought that this was very complicated. So in mechanism, I usually try to view both the context and the stakeholder. So the context is how the world looks like status quo. St stakeholder are specific actors and explaining why certain actors would behave in that way. So context is I think two things. Firstly, setting up the debate, right? So for example, if the motion is about um, environmental movements and you think that it's more relevant in the developing world, by saying that you think that this motion is more relevant in the developing world, you could build specific arguments related to that context. For example, that economic development is a very dire necessity in developing nations, therefore blah, blah, blah. Or if you say that this debate is most relevant in rich households, for example, if the motion is about private education and mostly in rich households is where they can afford private education with the characteristic that they're rich households, you can also build specific characterization or observations that could further explain why something is true. Or yeah, the second type is trend. So I think this is what the PM used in the show debate we just saw. So what the PM said was, look, there's a trend where there's a mismatch between the supply and demand of jobs. Because of that, these problems are happening. Therefore, we think that employability um, 
is being lost in the status quo. And we can fix that because we adjust the supply and demand of labor in industries like STEM or industries like scientific fields. So by explaining trends, so this could be things like the rise of right-wing populism in diverse states or economic instability caused by COVID-19. If you think of that, you could build much specific mechanisms to prove why something is true. The second is stakeholders. So when you um, characterize a stakeholder, first you could think of the incentive structure of that individual. So, or that entity, right? So for example, a politician would be interested in re-election, um, company would be interested in profit maximization or whatnot. Second is knowledge or the intellectual capability. So for example, if a person is very young, probably that person is going to be irrational. Um, for example, if a person is um, afraid of something, like for example, people who are really afraid of death might have a higher tendency of opting into religion or whatnot, or the level of education that people had, or the lived experience of a person. So for example, if I'm an African-American in the United States, the lived experience of police brutality or um, discrimination would probably render me to do different things than a very privileged white person who has never went through those discriminations. So this is the second criteria. Third is capacity. So whether an entity has a physical power or economic power or political connection. Fourth is relationship with other stakeholders. So this all sounds very abstract. So I'm going to try to re-emphasize them while going through the exercise. So as of now, if you could just generally understand what these terms means, um, that's going to be fine. So when you want to mechanize that something is true, think about the world that we're living in and the specific actors that exist within that world. And with that, other than just saying, look, um, if we implement this policy, employability is going to increase, as opposed to that, saying that this trend exists in status quo, the stakeholder we're talking about, most people, they don't come into universities to spend four years of their life to get jobs, and that's what the incentive structure of their um, actors looks like, then with those specific explanations, your arguments become much more specific. The second part about impact is explaining why something is important. So the first thing to do when you explain the impact of an argument is you want to vividly describe the result or the outcome. So for example, um, in the debate we just saw, um, running through what unemployment looks like. Hey, when you go into your 25 year old, you don't have a job, you can't marry, you have to live under your parents and you feel terrible about your self-worth. Just vividly describing what that looks like gives the judge a lot of intuition as to why your argument is important. So that's the first part. But more, you also want to explain the context, right? So I think um, the example about supply and demand also works here. So we live in a world where increasingly AI or automation is coming in. So unemployability is going to be a huge problem. And within that context, within that society, therefore unemployability or employability is the most important metric of today's debate. Third is principle. So for example, um, if you go on with that argument and say, look, right to job is very important. Look at many cases of where the government subsidizes um, job training programs um, for unemployed people or for, for ex-convicts. We think that the right to job is an important principle and it's important because of EDI ED reasons, then you're also using a principle to further impact your argument. Lastly is to explicitly provide some metrics and by metrics, we mean standards by which we evaluate um, arguments. So these are some metrics that we could use. So I think the best example to illustrate metrics is debates on affirmative action. So by debates on affirmative action, it's putting a specific quota on, for example, university. So legally mandating that at least 40% of your college students should be women, or at least 30% of your college student or workplace workers should be African-Americans. So it's usually setting a certain seat for minorities so that they have more accessibility to educational institutions or um, workplace institutions, right? So if you're the site that argues for affirmative action, probably you would use vulnerability as a metric. Look, if you're a woman or if you're an African-American, you face much more discrimination within your workplace. 
So this stakeholder that we're trying to protect, which are women or social minorities, are discriminated in all other facets of our society. They are really vulnerable. They're usually not rich. They're usually financially worse off. They're usually education-wise worse off. Therefore, they deserve much more of our moral attention. You can also similarly talk about historical relationships. For example, African-Americans have had the history of being oppressed and therefore the United States government or whatever government has a duty to, repar to reparate for that harms, to compensate for that harms. Therefore, protecting these stakeholders is important. So we use historical relationship as a metric. The other side could argue, look, if you try to prioritize African-Americans, then that means that other, other race um, demographics, like white Americans are gonna be pushed out of their jobs or pushed out of their um, college seats, right? But these people constitute a bigger part of our population. They constitute like more than 60% of our population. Therefore, our side benefits more people. Therefore, the scale should be the metric by which we judge the debate. So in impacting, you're arguing for different metrics and therefore saying that because this metric should be the way we judge the debate, our argument should be more important. Yeah, um, are there any questions about um, the practical arguments, mechanism and impacts? Great, um, I think that it would have been a little unclear, so I prepared an exercise. So the motion is, this house would adopt a pass-fail grading system for students who suffer from mental health problems. So depression or bipolar disorder. So instead of making them compete normally as we do in Korean high schools or whatever high schools, we just adopt a pass-fail system, which would mean that they will probably have to study much less and would still get a pass because that's what pass-fail systems usually do. So suppose you're opposition and you're running an argument that look, if we adopt this pass-fail grading system, then people with mental health problems are gonna suffer from more social stigma or social stigmatization as in negative stereotypes or negative images or discrimination that these people receive. Because, um, yeah, I'm not gonna give the mechanism myself. So because of this, they will suffer from social stigma. Um, think about how, would you, how you would run it, how you would both mechanize it in terms of context and stakeholder, also about how you would impact this. So one thing to note is you don't have to use all of these components. You just employ what's relevant in every argument or specific debates or context. So don't be too stressed about doing all vivid discrimination principle, context, and metric. Just think about what will be relevant in the debate and try to think about it um, with that. So I'll give you about two minutes to think about um, both the mechanism and the impact of principle argument. Okay, so time's up. So are there any volunteers? Um, I would really appreciate that.
Are there no volunteers? Um, those are these are really not difficult stuff. So, not for you. <laughs> well, okay, I'll still go. Thank um, you. I, um, I feel like I might be wrong because I'm very biased on this issue, so it's really hard for me to argue opposition, but. Um, for stakeholders, I would say that um, um, this policy, like opposing this policy, so this policy would basically be putting um, the small fraction of students with mental health problems at like overwhelming advantage over the vast majority of students who who have deadlines for for all their assignments and have to put in that extra work and extra dedication to um, rank themselves at the top of like at, at a higher portion of their class in order to get into college so for mechanism I would uh, and stakeholders I would um, definitely emphasize um, the vast majority of students who haven't been diagnosed with mental health problems and for impact um, I would definitely say that it puts um, it puts like the minority at like overwhelming advantage and like um, considering that there's no historic example, I mean, that I'm aware of, of like pass fail grading systems being adopted for students who suffer from mental health problems, I would, um, I would talk about how it uh, further would uh, increase the stigma around the already bad uh, stigma when it comes to mental health and how that's actually not gonna benefit uh, students with uh, by depression or bipolar disorder at the end of the day, yeah. I think that was a really good mechanism and an impact. So it's kind of similar to what I was preparing for the lecture material as well. So firstly, yeah. So firstly, in terms of stakeholders, yeah, I think the most important stakeholders are students or parents who aren't diagnosed with mental health problems. So we could really walk through how much academic competition there exists within our society. Um, people do crazy stuff to go to universities. They spend thousands of dollars in private education. So in that very highly competitive environment, would these people really be tolerable to these individuals and go like, hey, if a classmate of mine gets a really sweet um, access way to getting into a prestigious university, whereas I who spent 10 hours a day studying thousands of dollars into private education cannot get to that university or cannot succeed as equally, it's very likely that these people are going to think that's unfair. So that could be a mechanism in terms of stakeholders. Um, also, um, I thought one context that it could add to mechanism was that we already have a lot of social stereotypes that people with mental disorders are not ordinary people. So for example, in process of employment, people are unwilling to take in people who are people who are diagnosed with mental illnesses because we think that they're different from us. Whereas actually um, a mental illness is something that does not define, solely define who you are, right? But this narrative that these people are different, that they go through a different education system actually entrenches that stereotype as well. So I think talking both about stakeholder and context could help build that mechanism. In terms of impact, um, yeah, was, was there a question? Yeah, could I also, could it also be, you know, mentioned that like people could use mental health uh, problems as like, they could like abuse the policy and um, they could, for example, pay doctors to forge, um, mm -hmm. forge prescriptions that they have depression or mental health like disorders. Like a lot of my, I mean, a lot of, I'm from America. So like I took the SAT test and I know that a lot of, um, wealthy individuals pay doctors thousands of dollars to forge a prescription saying that they have um, dyslexia when they actually don't so that they get extra time when taking the test so like uh, i think it could also be mentioned that um this there's a high risk of abuse abuse and like abusing the system yeah just wanted to say that so this was actually a motion that i got in a tournament and i did run that argument as well but i think it's not really a social stigma so if you were to link it with social stigma you could go like hey then people might even if you actually have a mental problem, people might think that you're lying to get a sweet deal in the education system. So that doubt that people have about your mental health problem might become a source of social stigma as well. So I think that could also work as well. 
So coming back to impact, I think the first thing you might want to do is to just describe what that stigma would look like. So students might be bullied in schools, job applicants might not be hired, hired, and this might worsen the mental health problems that they already have because many of the mental health problems come from the social interactions that we have with other individuals and people will continuously question you. People will continuously view you as a different person. So this might have a very huge impact to these individuals. So a vivid description, rather than just saying that, hey, a stigma will exist, really delving into the specific cases and nuances really help. Second is context. So we live in a society where mental problems, we have a certain level of medication, we have a certain level of counseling programs, but the one area where this mental health problem, people with mental health problems suffer the most is subtle biases, right? So we don't go like actively discriminate you or we don't like actively hit you, but very subtle discriminations where people are unwilling to get close to you, where they have very skewed stereotypes about you are the primary area in which mental health problems are not being fixed. So we think that given the context where this is the biggest problem we face, aggravating this area would be the last thing that we want to do. Um, principle may be right to work, metric may be exclusivity, but I don't think it's as relevant as the things that I just described above. So you don't want to apply everything in every debate, but you want to selectively choose what would strategically benefit your argument. Yeah. So things to consider when making arguments is firstly, organize, don't just throw points. So probably um, you would go, so in today's show debate, you probably would have recognized that a lot of people ask rhetorical, rhetorical questions. It's not because they're weird people, but because that helps them organize. So why is this important or why is this true? And then they, they go on to label, firstly, in terms of um, the fact that students and parents might think it's unfair, second, context, and then they move on to go like, hey, then why is this important? Two reasons why, one, two. So if you, um, if you saw like how arguments are made, it really requires a lot of work because to explain why something is true and to explain why something is important really requires a lot of work and a lot of effort. So to do that, you want to make sure that you just don't want to throw points here and there within the speech, but you want to structure them into arguments and organize them as much as possible. Second is, um, it's good to consider both worlds. So. Um, delta or marginal difference is the term that we use to describe the difference between the two worlds that we're comparing. So if you're arguing that in their world, social stereotypes are gonna get worsened, then the counter burden is for you to prove why social stereotypes will not get worsened on their side. So oftentimes in many debates, let's say that the motion is about economic depression and you are so hyped up to talk about why economic depressions will happen on their side, but then you don't prove why they won't happen on your side, then it kind of like beats the purpose of the argument. So make sure that you're considering both worlds within that argument. Um, the third thing, and I think this is the most important part, is it's good to understand where the controversial part of your argument is. So for example, in the argument that we just built, impacting why people with mental health problems are an important stakeholder will get you no points in the debate. Because presumably, government would also be very invested into solving, solving the problem that mental health on patients have, right? So no one will attack that point or no one will rebut that point. So make sure that you don't go and impact those very unnecessary, widely consented values within our society. But second, um, also try to preempt easy rebuttals. So for example, the very easy rebuttal that Gov could have is, look, people are very generally sympathetic towards those with mental health problems. How can you assume that they would bully or how they would, they would discriminate, right? So by adding mechanisms, for example, we just emphasize the extreme over-competition that people go through. So by emphasizing or mechanizing that, you're kind of preempting because look, we could say that people are sympathetic in very general terms when they see a person on an SNS or a documentary, but when they actually are in that situation where they're deprived of their seat or deprived of their jobs, we don't think that people will become so sympathetic or become so altruistic because 
of all that context that we provided just before. So when you say preemption, it isn't going like they will say this and to that will preemptively say three things. That is not necessarily what we mean by preemption. Preemptions are more like nuancing or identifying what part of your argument you want to spend a lot of your time on. And the two criteria that I use is don't spend time on obvious stuff. Try to preempt the easiest rebuttals and make that into a mechanism. Um, third is that details matter. So firstly, in terms of making very specific headlines. So I've heard this from a very um, prestigious prime minister debater. So he says that if rather than just saying backlash or social stigmatization, if you say, well, we're going to talk about that this policy will lead to social stigma, which will in the end deprive mental health patients of the right to blah, 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 or the right to assimilate into society. If you create that very specific headline, the judge is psychologically inclined to make that fill in the missing links for you. Because while listening to that, they are already imagining how that argument looks like. So make sure that you make specific headlines to make advantage of that. But more importantly, second, um, using the language of urgency, right? So for example, saying that the environment will get better versus the IPCC, IPCC says that if we don't um, prevent the climate from increasing 1.5 degrees in a couple of years, then we will suffer a global catastrophe and we can only overcome that on our side. The language of urgency is very different, right? So in the example show debate we just saw as well, the argument that, hey, people might be able to get jobs versus there's a huge trend of people not getting jobs. This is an urgent problem. We need to fix that. The latter is much stronger in terms of rhetoric. So that could also help. Last is some word choice. So rather than saying disappointment, maybe saying trauma might be a little more impacting. Rather than saying we have better resources, saying that economic survival at stake might also be very important. So think about specific words that could make your argument more dramatic or impactful as well. So this concludes the argument part of the lecture. Um, are there any questions? Um, could you explain the specific headlines part one more time? So you could explain what your argument is and what the result of it is. So rather than saying stigma, you could formulate a sentence that this policy will lead to negative social perceptions, which will hamper the assimilation of the mental health patients into society. But by being specific, the judge is able to look and understand the direction of your argument. And at the same time, um, psychologically, they're also inclined to kind of imagine how they would run that argument as well. So that kind of helps if you don't provide a sufficient explanation, they might be inclined to fill in the dots for you. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, the second part is rebuttals. So. Some key notes is that a response is not the same as a rebuttal. So a response is just providing a counter statement or pointing out what they didn't prove. A rebuttal requires you to counter proof. So for example, when in the show debate we just saw, if Gov argues that they would fix unemployment, Op just says, hey, you won't be able to. That's a response. But if they go on to talk about, hey, you won't be able to fix unemployment because of the structural reasons that they talked about or because of X, Y, Z reasons, just as if you're mechanizing an argument, if you do that to the fullest extent, we call that a rebuttal. So it's very important that you often have to respond to some points because they're not just important and they're not fully elaborated by the other side, but you also want to rebut some very major crux of the debate because um, you want to completely destroy certain arguments. So make sure that you know what to prioritize and not. Um, second is um, examples themselves are not rebuttals. So your example might be the exception, not the norm. So for example, um, in the debate we just saw, if opposition comes up and says, look, um, Harvard doesn't do that, and they have very successful benefits in terms of X, Y, Z, then that could be because just Harvard is a university with very special students, very smart and talented students, right? So if you are to present an example, you need to walk through what that example means. So for example, if you're using the example of the New Deal, the New Deal was su successful because of X, Y, Z reasons. And this is applicable to this debate because of ABC reasons. 
So providing logic into examples are very important as well. And yeah, thirdly, layer and diversify your bottles. So I think there are mainly three types of rebuttals that are very important in um, debates. The first is negation, second is mitigation, and third is weighing. So negation is arguing that their argument isn't true. A mitigation is arguing that actually their world is um, different from, is not so different from our world. So we're not saying that their argument isn't true entirely, but that the impact of their argument is not as huge as they say. The third is weighing. So it's saying that even if their argument is true, our argument is much more important. So firstly, in terms of negation, um, the best way to do, uh, one way of doing a negation is to provide a counter possibility. So they could say that this policy benefits the economy in this way, but you could argue that this harms the economy in another way. So you're just providing another argument under the same headline or on proving a certain same and identical premise. So it's practically making an argument. So it's just, just, just the same stuff. But second is to rebut to the opponent's analysis. So rather than just talking about something else, seeing that their analysis is wrong because they didn't prove this and they only proved this. So yeah, we're just gonna delve into this in the exercise we're gonna have afterwards. Um, so this is negation. Second is mitigation. So I think the opposition in the show debate tried to mitigate a lot. So when they talked about um, um, unemployment on Gulf, the first thing they said was to say, look, our world can achieve those benefits too. So they provided an alternative, which is, look, governments can do job training. Governments should do other programs that facilitate employment. So they're suggesting an alternative, saying that their benefit can be achieved on our side of the bench as well. The second is to do talk about organic change. So for example, um, if the motion is affirmative action, as we talked about, and we are on the side that we don't need affirmative action, saying that, look, um, the society is becoming increasingly liberal. We're seeing like a lot of women being in very highly prestigious political positions like vice president or president in the case of Korea, we're seeing African-American presidents as well. So we don't need this artificial policy, but we just need to have, wait for this organic natural change to happen. So this means that the relative benefit on their side is smaller. But the second strategy of mitigation is to say that actually they cannot achieve those benefits as well. And this was also what the opposition in the show debate tried to do. So they say, look, even if problem is fixed on a university level, there are other structural factors in the job market. So although it wasn't as persuasive in this debate because of what the judge talked about, like they, they were still able to prove some marginal benefit, but still it mitigated a huge part of their benefit, right? By talking about how there are other structural factors. And just because you change this aspect of the reality doesn't mean that the entire problem is solved. So by using these two strategies, you can mitigate the benefit. But the problem is just because you mitigate an argument doesn't mean that that argument is invalid, right? Because you made the argument smaller, but it still exists, right? So usually a mitigation is coupled with weighing, which is that even if their argument is true, our argument is much more important. So this is what we call a trade-off or a comparative. This is the benefit on their side that is the benefit on their side. And then we're weighing those arguments or trading off these arguments, right? So usually what you do is in weighing, you attack the impact of their argument, right? So you're saying that the impact of their argument is not as huge as they talked about. And therefore, it usually comes together with a mitigation, right? Because by mitigating, you are decreasing the impact of an argument. So how do you weigh? You weigh it by using the same tools that we used in impacting, right? So description, we describe our arguments in a very persuasive way, and we don't for their arguments. Or we provide context, that means that in, within this context, our argument is more important. So for example, in the pass-fail mental health problem debate that we just had, um, if Gov argues about, hey, these people will go to good universities, versus our argument is that on a societal level, they are gonna have a harder time getting jobs, harder time forming friends, 
And because on a contextual level, this is the area in which the mental health patients suffer the most. In that context, this argument is more important or to provide a principle or a metric identically. So these are the three tricks that I find to be very useful in um, rebuttals. Are there any questions at this point of the lecture? Okay, so now we're gonna do an exercise. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see a video of a PM speech and we're gonna envision how we would rebut that, imagining you're the leader of opposition. So in this debate, we can do all three, negation, mitigation, and weighing. So try to think of that. And I think the most obvious argument on opposition and the motion in poor countries, this also sell all national relics and other sites with cultural and historical importance would be cultural rights, right? Even if you're a poor country, you still want to own culture. You still think that national culture is important versus God would probably be arguing economic development, right? So think about how you would weigh that on the side of opposition. Mr. Speaker, we are extremely happy to be the side that acknowledges the hierarchy of rights that exist within people. We are extremely happy to sacrifice national relics. If it can come for cleaner water, if it can come for vaccines, if it can come for food for people, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we're talking about countries in Africa, South Asia, and South America, where most citizens live below the abject poverty line, which means that they don't have access to basic humanitarian needs. They are not satisfied. There are people starving on the roads. They are lacking education. They are lacking welfare. They are lacking health care and everything. So in those countries, we are saying that they should actually sell their national relics and historically importance of anything in order to make money for the government to fund those people. And they will come and pick on us by saying that governments are so corrupt that they will never give the money to poor people. And we will tell you why that's not going to happen under their model. We will react that case and we will tell you how government in these countries, especially in the modern context, do have incentive to fund these people and to actually raise the national economy to a certain level to the speaker. So going on to my principal justification. We think that we are the only side that acknowledges higher of needs of people, Mr. Speaker, because they are saying that national historical pride is more important than your own right to drink clean water, your own not right to not get cold and die off from it, Mr. Speaker. We think that in terms of individuals, only when individuals are able to not starve, not sleep on the streets, can they think about sustainable self-actualization of themselves, sustainable submittance to a certain identity, to a certain national pride, and what not, Mr. Speaker. We think that fundamental justification for individual <coughs> citizens living there happens from that very acknowledgement of the hierarchy of rights that exists within the individuals, Mr. Speaker. But secondly, going on to the governmental level of fundamental, of fundamental justification, Mr. Speaker, we think that when those resources of national relics exist within, within those regions, just like other kinds of, or other kinds of natural resources, we think government has right to exploit those resources in order for the government to utilize it in the direction that government wants to utilize it, Mr. Speaker, because the government is the only capable and incentivized actor to think in the long term and see the prospects of the country, Mr. Speaker. In that case, we think government is fully justified to utilize the resources that exist within those regions and actually make it That's better so that people can live from the money that government gets, Mr. Speaker. Now, going on to the really important part about what are the problems in the domain. What are the problems in, the, in those regions and how those problems can be solved with the money we get from our national relics, Mr. Speaker? We're going to tell you very clearly, I'm not taking you. Okay, so the problem is that there is no economic development there, there's lack of infrastructure, natural resources, there is no development of industry, and the size of the economy is extremely small, and the government budget size is also extremely small, Mr. Speaker. I tell you that in both democratic and undemocratic states, in those states, we think that there is fundamental need that these most impoverished, de deprived people, to fund these most impoverished, deprived people so that they can go above the abject poverty line, Mr. Speaker. Any kind of regime, either democratic, either undemocratic, both has those kind of incentives. Yeah, Why is it, though, thank you. Why is it, Mr. Speaker? We think that in terms of a democratic government, of course people would vote for their own quality of life, Mr. Speaker. And it's also the state's basic responsibility to cater to every single individual being's need within that state, Mr. Speaker, in a democratic state. So we think that in those cases, of course, individual needs that are below the abject poverty line would of course be used in order to 
to improve the life quality of those students. But also, in all democratic states, Mr. Speaker, what's happening? Because we think that, oh, first of all, it is in the incentive of all democratic states to have healthy citizens to begin with, Mr. Speaker. When the healthy citizens can become laborers and can expand the economic the economic stability and therefore expand the regime's political stability and whatnot. We think there is an inherent incentive for an undemocratic dictatorial government to actually make unhealthy citizens healthy. Second of all, there are a huge amount of international criticism, sanctions, and whatnot, political methods to actually block this dictatorial government from actually leaving these people to starve, Mr. Speaker. We think that there are certain leverages in the international field that actually make this, uh, make this government uh, allocate their budget in order to make people not starve, make people not die off from disease, Mr. Speaker. So we think that there is an incentive there. And third of all, we think that when people are extremely impoverished and sick, they, they turn into other like mechanisms like being a, becoming a political military rebel and whatnot. We think that there is an inherent incentive, and therefore, for all democratic states to care about these people, poor people's needs. And therefore, that's why when they have an expansion, a sudden expansion of government budget, they will allocate it to the most impoverished people of that region. Yeah, so I think that was pretty much all that we needed. Um, so if we summarize Gov PM's speech, it's firstly in terms of principles, she talks about priority of rights and the government right to property of these cultural products. Second, she talks about solvency of economic problems, like that there exists incentive to cater, cater to the most impoverished both in democratic and undemocratic regimes. So it's practically one big argument where she firstly impacts and provides the principle for that argument and then goes on to mechanize them, right? So um, does anyone want to volunteer or? I don't think anyone would, right? Okay, um, yeah, since we're kind of running late, so I'll just do it myself. Oh. Is there a comment? Uh, yeah, so I'll just do it. So first in terms of negation, right? So let's think about what she proved and what she didn't prove, right? So firstly, she said, look, an incentive exists for the state to do good things for the people. She proved incentive of a stakeholder, but she didn't prove things like capacity or she didn't prove things like other aspects that are needed to, um, wait. Yeah, so she didn't prove um, other aspects that are needed to prove that this money will be used well. So you could go like, look, we think that the state has every incentive to make sure that people don't rebel against them. But oftentimes it's the case that specific actors within the government are unregulated. So even if I, as a president, want this money to go somewhere, the middle level people have a tendency of using that money nonetheless. So just because you have incentive doesn't mean that you're able to prevent corruption. Or talking about, hey, we agree, most undemocratic regimes are the context of the debate, but their argument only proves why the government have an incentive to keep a basic minimum level of economic development not something beyond that, right? So maybe we could in, like temporarily um, solve or make people not starve, but they give you no reason as to why the government would promote for macro level economic development or a massive level of alleviation of poverty, which is what they were going for. So first you can negate that argument. Second, in terms of mitigation. So you go like, like if, she, if you look at the rhetoric of PM, it was very extreme, right? People are dying, vaccines, whatnot. But you could go like, hey, our world is not a world where not everyone is dying off, right? We have money from international organizations. We have developmental aid. And we see poverty rates decreasing every year. So you mitigate their benefit by saying that the problem isn't as severe. Or you could go like, hey, is their argument the critical tipping point? So the thesis of your argument is that the money we earn from selling all these relics are the critical tipping point by which we solve poverty or by which we solve economic problems. But mostly we think that 
economic problems have a lot to do with structural factors, like developed nations doing agricultural uh, subsidies or multinational corporations extracting labor or very infrastructure from developing nations and just giving money to these countries are not going to solve these structural problems that are needed to solve poverty. So with that, you're shrinking the impacts of the argument about economic development. And obviously, because this argument still exists, you can weigh them as well. So even if this is marginally benefits economic development, it is still extremely bad in terms of culture and national identity. So they said that according to Maslow's hierarchy of rights, you can only enjoy culture when you have economic backgrounds or economic needs fulfilled. But if you think about, for example, religion, of how many of these relics have huge religious importance and many people are willing to sacrifice their lives for religion or sacrifice a material good for religion, you can't really say that hierarchy of rights always are formed in this way. So you're applying a metric or you could say that, look, in the context in which many poor countries have suffered from colonialism, where they have been deprived or thieved of their culture, therefore they're very sensitive towards being ripped off of their cultural rights, then because of this context, the argument about culture might be more important than a marginal benefit of economic development that PM talked about. So you're again weighing the argument about culture and um, econ, and you're employing the same skill sets that we were studying during the impacting part of arguments. So that is all for the rebuttal part. Um, are there any questions? Okay. So lastly, um, strategizing. Not really, um, it's not gonna take up a lot of time. So I think we'll end on time. So framing is usually consisted, um, framing is something that you would listen a lot in feedback or OAs. So framing is explaining what is important in the debate. So you have different types of arguments, different types of rebuttals, then what is the most relevant argument or what is the most important part of the debate? Because there are so much arguments rather than impacting individual level arguments saying that this is what the debate is about and our argument is here, whereas their argument is not within the most important criteria of the debate, really helps you um, have a more advantageous ground within the debate. So these are three things that I consider a lot when I frame debates. First is to clarify vague words within the motion. So oftentimes you'll meet motions with words that are very abstract. So for example, this house believes that freedom of speech should be considered obsolete. Like what does obsolete mean, right? It's very abstract. So if you're able to clarify what this word means, you can make your arguments relevant. So in this debate, I was opposition. And therefore, uh, in the Gulf case was that the fact that freedom of speech is considered in a very absolute right harms, for example, minorities, because things like hate speech can be justified. So what I tried to frame was that just because we consider we don't consider something to be obsolete doesn't mean that we consider such thing to be absolute. Because, for example, the right to property is not an obsolete right. It's a very important right, right? But it's we tax people, right? Which means that this right to property is not an absolute right. So I try to argue that things that we consider obsolete are things like kings inheriting positions or the caste system where we divide people based according to ethnicity or whatnot. Those things are what we want to consider as obsolete. Freedom of speech definitely is something that we don't want to identify similarly with those things. So that kind of really helped me try to just move on with government's points because like defending hate speech is hard. So rather doing that, I write to I like to frame the debate in an advantageous manner. The second is on um, identifying what the most relevant area of the debate should be. And I think I already covered this when I talked about um, mental health problems. So in that debate, I started my introduction by saying that, um, Mr. Speaker, the most um, biggest problem that the uh, people with mental health problems suffer is this totalizing narrative that a mental health problem is all of who you are. Whereas we think that it's just a part of who you are and that negative stereotype itself is really bad. And therefore we think that stigma and perception should be the most important area of the debate. 
So with that, you're contextualizing what the most important argument in the debate is. Third is providing the key comparison of your case and the opposition case. So here you want to identify key premises of opposition um, or the government team. So maybe in the show debate we just saw, the key premise of opposition was that social movements or those kind of stuff need to happen at universities. But as you listen to the verdict, one of the reasons why opposition lost was because they weren't able to prove what that needs to happen in the university. So you could go like, Mr. Speaker, our argument about employability was something that needs to happen in universities because many people join universities in the expectation that they could get a job there. Whereas we think that social movements are not the primary function of um, universities and can happen through diverse means like SNS, can happen through things like other um, social movements that happen offline or whatnot. This means that the comparative in this debate is an argument that is tied very correlated to the central function of universities versus something that could happen in other areas. And because of this comparison, we think that we win the debate. So if you're perhaps a whip speaker or a deputy speaker, um, summarizing very key characteristics of both teams' arguments and thereby comparing those two cases could help in terms of framing. So this is the last slide. So strategy should start from the beginning of prep time. Always think about what the other side will say, because as we talked about, when you make arguments, you want to preempt at the same time. Second is during prep time, you should think about what your advantages battleground is. So for example, um, in the past fail grading system, obviously social stereotypes is your advantages ground. Maybe things like academic stress is your losing debate, right? So you want to kind of like, I don't know, kind of like scam the judge into believing that the social perception is the most important area of the debate. So thinking about how you would frame the debate into social perception, then maybe one thing you want to consider during prep time as well. Third is during prep time, you need to think about what your ultimate narrative or case line is. So oftentimes teams just throw different arguments and just hope like throw five different points and hope that the judge will find that persuasive. But think about what those all five arguments lead to and what is the essential sentence that your case can be summarized to. Um, you can watch this um, after the lecture. It's uh, PM speech has a very good case line, but think about what the logical flow or the relationship of your arguments is. So A leads to B, B leads to C, and therefore a narrative is completed. Maybe your arguments might be formulated in this way, or you could talk about different things, but you still need to talk with your teammates of what the most important arguments are and what the less important arguments are. Because if PM spends seven minutes on this argument and you don't think that that's the most important argument, then probably the judge is gonna be also very confused of what you think is the most important argument. And therefore, even if this is a very important and a strong argument, might think that your argument is another one and therefore make you lose. So make sure that you consent about what the ultimate narrative of your team case is. And lastly, um, before your speech, you should think about where you want to spend most of your time on. So oftentimes when you debate, you'll just write down things that pop into your head and read them off without a certain strategy. Um, I'm usually web, so before I move on to my speech, I go like, what are some two to three contributions I want to provide in my speech? And I try to focus on these stuff um, specifically, even if I don't write them down extensively. So altering your speech structure and having a strategy in your speech is also very important. Um, yeah, so these are some recommendations of lectures. I'll share the PDF file on, on the comments as soon as the lecture is over. So maybe you could take a look at them after the lecture. Um, thank you. Um, I think it was a really messy, messy lecture because I try to cover a lot of stuff. But I hope it was helpful. Um, um, and if you have any questions, now would be a great time to ask them. Um, it could be something related or something that's wholly relevant with the lecture as well, just something related to debate. 
Thank you so much for Yun Chan for that lecture. I think that it was not just an intro to AP lecture, but it just um, talked about all the components of Asian parliamentary. So this will be very helpful for you even as you proceed um, with Asian parliamentary debating. We will get this PPT from Yun Chan and we will give it to your society head. So anyone that wants to look at the links that Yun Chan has prepared or any of the examples or materials that he covered in his lecture, please feel free to do, do so. So another a round of applause for Yun Chan for everything that he did today. Thank you so much. Um, before we end, we do have people that are going to receive awards, rewards for their guessing or for their judging skills um, for the show debate. So I'll pass the mic to Chuan to announce those people. Um, hi, I have used the random uh, winner selector choosing random choosing wheel. I don't know the <laughs> accurate name of it, but I use that random wheel for transparency and I have brought screenshotted versions. So to be transparent. So the five people who uh, were chosen, I wrote the name here on the next slide. Please um, write your phone number to uh, and direct message me to the Kita Secretariat account and I will send you the Kakao Talk or um, text message gift icon to you guys um tomorrow today or tomorrow so the winners are um Cha Songhyun, Kearney Allen sorry I'm not sure if I pronounced uh, correctly An Yesol, Ji Ho Kim, Jaehyun Park please send me your phone number so that I can send you the gifts congrats all of you so five people please send me um before you leave the zoom room um, if you want to know more about us, as Jihee have already told you, we have a Facebook page named Korean InterVarsity Debate Association. Instagram is at Kira Secretariat. Email is kirasecretariats at gmail.com. We also have a website. So if you um, Google Kira Secretariat's website, you will going to see um, our website. You're going to see all of the Kira Council minutes, our history, our constitution, or any activities or photos or any lecture videos, everything you're kind of curious about us. And if you want to know more, just DM us or send email to us. We will going to respond to you ASAP. So that's all for today's um, Kira Open House. If you um, guys have any question, please um, ask us before we end this Zoom meeting. Again, thank you really, um, thank you a lot for joining us today. I hope we can meet you again in any future tournaments. And yeah, it was great to see you guys. Thank you, um, show debaters and lecturer and audience who joined us. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Is the Kita RT impromptu? Like are yes. all the rounds so all Kita tournaments are all um in diversity collegiate level tournaments are impromptu. You will not be given um so you'll give you'll be given 30 minutes to prepare for your speeches, okay. but you will not be given mm -hmm. the motions in advance days before the tournament. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, my question before we leave the Zoom and how could you upload the PPT? Gu Yun Chan. Oh, I'll just do that. I'll just post it firstly on the chat as well, and you'll probably be able to get it through YouTube and Facebook as well. Um, I haven't okay. been added to the chat. Could someone? Yeah, I haven't. So what's going to happen is Yunchan is going to send it to Zoom chat, I think. Or if not, I'll get the PPT from Yunchan. I'll give it to your society heads, so your society heads can delay that information to you. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay. Um, Yun Chan sent the P PDF um, in the chat. We received all five phone numbers from people that were selected. Um, thank you guys so much. You guys can leave. We'll see you next week at Kira Pre Tournament. Bye bye.